Oh, I'm sorry, the girl replied. I was so startled to see you. Inspector Chan, this is Mr. Kenaway. I've just been telling him what a wonderful party he missed last night. He's all upset. You know, he belongs to such a family in Boston, and he isn't accustomed to being left out. Nonsense, Kenaway said. He would have been very welcome, Charlie remarked. He turned to the young man. I myself have keen interest in Boston, and some day we must enjoy small talk about same. Just now, I will not further interrupt your perambulations. Since I was introduced to your entire party yesterday, full name and title, it will be useless for me to attempt dissemble of my identity. So I propose to meet all of you, presently, for little chat about last night. Same old story, Kenaway replied. We've been gathered together to meet policemen at frequent intervals ever since the tour started. Well, you're bringing a new face into it, and that's something. I wish you luck, Inspector Chan. Thank you so much. I shall do my best. True, I am coming into the case through the back door. But I am encouraged when I remember old saying which remarks, The turtle that enters the house at the rear gate comes finally to the head of the table. Ah, yes, in the soup, Kenaway reminded him. Chan laughed. Ancient proverbs must not be taken too literally. Pardon me while I sample the cuisine of this vessel. At some later hour I shall sample your society more extensively. He went to the dining saloon, where he was given a good table to himself. After a hearty breakfast, he rose to leave. In a seat near the door, he saw Dr. Lofton. He stopped. Ah, doctor, he said, perhaps you do me the honor to recall my face? Lofton glanced up. Few people could look at Charlie without a friendly smile, but the doctor managed it. In fact, his expression was a rather sour one. Yes, he said, I remember you. A policeman, I believe. I am inspector of detectives, attached to Honolulu Station, Charlie explained. May I sit down, please? I suppose so, Lofton growled. But don't blame me if my feelings are none too cordial. I'm a bit fed up with detectives. Where is your friend Duff this morning? Charlie raised his eyebrows. You have not heard what happened to Inspector Duff? Of course not, snapped Lofton. I've got twelve people to look after, and I can assure you that they keep me busy. I can't bother with every policeman who tags along. What's happened to Duff? Come on, man, speak. Don't tell me he's been killed too. Not entirely, Chan answered gently. He told his story, his little black eyes fixed on Lofton's face. He was amazed at the lack of shock or sympathy on that bearded countenance. Well, that's the end of Duff, as far as this tour is concerned, the doctor remarked when Chan had finished. And now what? Now I replace poor Duff. Lofton stared at him. You? he cried rudely. Why not? asked Charlie blandly. Well, no reason, I suppose. You'll pardon me, but my nerves have been completely upset by the events of the last few months. Thank God we break up at San Francisco, and it's a question in my mind if I ever go out again. I've been thinking of retiring, and this is as good a time as any. Whether you do or not is a private and personal matter, Chan told him. What is not so private is, what is name of the killer who has honored you with his presence on this journey? It is an affair I am here to look into, with full authority to do so. If you will get your party together in the lounge at ten o'clock, I shall launch the campaign. Lofton glared at him. How long, O oh Lord, how long? he said. I shall be brief as possible. You know what I mean. How long must I continue to gather my party together for these inquisitions? Nothing ever comes of them, ever has or ever will, if you ask me. Charlie gave him a searching look. And you would be sorry. If anything did, he ventured. Lofton returned the look. Why should I try to deceive you? I am not longing for any final flare of publicity about this matter. That would mean the end of my touring days, and no mistake. An unpleasant end, too. 
No, what I want is a petering out of the whole business. You see, I intend to be frank with you. Quite refreshing. Thank you, bowed Charlie. I'll get the party together, of course, but further than that, if you look for any help from me, you'll be looking in the wrong place. Looking in wrong place is always terrible waste of time, Chan assured him. I'm glad you realize that, Lofton answered, and rising, moved toward the door. Chan followed meekly at his heels. Charlie went back to the promenade deck. He saw Kashimo flit by, resplendent in a new uniform, which fitted him only in spots. Pamela Potter was sitting in a deck chair and waved to him. He joined her. Your friend Mrs. Luce is not yet about? he inquired. No, she sleeps late at sea and has breakfast in her cabin. Did you want to speak with her right away? I wish to talk with the two of you, but you alone suffice in a very pleasant manner. Last night I set you down on dock at about nine o'clock. Tell me, what members of travel party did you encounter between that hour and moment of retiring? We saw several of them. The stateroom was quite warm, so we went up and sat in steamer chairs near the top of the gangplank. The Minchins came aboard presently, and Sadie stopped to show us her day's loot. A ukulele for that boy of hers at military school, among other things. Then Mark Kennaway came on, but he didn't stop with us. He thought Mr. Tate might want him for the eternal bedtime story. Then the Benbows, Elma, all loaded down with exposed film. That was all, I guess. Mr. Kennaway came back to us in a few minutes. He said Mr. Tate didn't seem to be aboard, and he appeared to think that rather surprising. Those were all? No man with a malacca stick? Oh, Mr. Ross, you mean? Yes, he was one of the first, I think. He came limping aboard. Pardon me, at about what time? It must have been about nine-fifteen. He passed where we were sitting. I thought he was limping even more than usual. Mrs. Luce spoke to him, but oddly enough he didn't answer. He just hurried on down the deck. Can you tell me, is his the only malacca stick in the party? The girl laughed. My dear Mr. Chan, we spent three days in Singapore, and if you don't buy a malacca stick there, they won't let you leave. Every man in our party has one at least. Charlie frowned. Indeed. Then how can you be absolutely certain it was Mr. Ross who passed you? Well, this man was limping. Simplest thing in the world to imitate. Think hard. Was there no other way in which you could identify him? The girl sat for a moment in silence. How's this? she remarked at last getting to be some little detective myself. The sticks that were bought in Singapore all had metal tips, I noticed that, but Mr. Ross's stick has a heavy rubber tip on it. It makes no noise when he walks along the deck. And the stick of the man who passed you last night? It made no sound, so the man must have been Mr. Ross. Am I good? Just to show you how good I am, I'll give you a demonstration. Here comes Mr. Ross now. Listen. Ross had appeared in the distance and was swinging along toward them. He passed with a nod and a smile and disappeared around the corner. Chan and the girl looked at each other, for accompanying the lame man like a chant, they had heard the steady tap, tap, tap of metal on the hard deck. Well, of all things, cried the girl. Mr. Ross's stick has lost its rubber tip, Charlie said. She nodded. What can that mean? A puzzle, Chan answered. And unless I am much mistaken, the first of many aboard this ship. Why should I worry? Puzzles are my business. Chapter 17 The Great Eastern Label At a little before ten, Lofton appeared in front of the chair where Chan was sitting. He still had the air of a much-abused man. Well, Inspector, he announced, I've got my people together in the smoking room. I chose that spot because it's always deserted at this hour. A bit odiferous, perhaps. I trust you won't hold them there long. 
I suggest you come at once. Keeping a touring party intact in one place for any length of time is, I have discovered, a difficult feat. Chan rose. Will you also come, Miss Pamela? he suggested. As they walked along, he added to the doctor, Am I to understand that all members of band are present? All except Mrs. Luce, Lofton told him. She prefers to sleep late, but I'll have her roused if you say so. Not at all, Chan replied. I know where Mrs. Luce was last evening. Matter of fact, she dined at my house. Not really, cried the doctor with unflattering surprise. You would have been welcome yourself, Charlie smiled. They entered the thick atmosphere of the smoking room, redolent of old, unhappy, far-off things and bottles long ago. The group inside regarded Chan with frank curiosity. He stood for a moment facing them. A little speech seemed indicated. May I extend courteous good morning, he began. Would say I am as surprised to see you all again as you must be to behold me. I am reluctant to enforce my unspeakable presence upon you, but fate will not have it otherwise. Inspector Duff, as you know, was awaiting you at Honolulu, paradise of Pacific, intending to travel eastward in your company. Last night, in paradise, history repeats, and Snake appears, striking down the worthy Duff. He is much better this morning, thank you. Maybe plenty soon he sees you all again. In meantime, a stupid substitute for Duff has been pushed into position for which he has not the brains, the wit, the reputation, notably myself. He smiled pleasantly and sat down. All mischief comes from opening the mouth, he continued. Knowing this, I am still forced to operate mine to considerable extent from now on. Let us make the best of it. My initial effort will be to find out from each of you exact presence between hour of, may I say, eight last evening and sailing of boat at ten. Pardon such outrageous hint, but any of you who fails to speak true may have cause to regret same later on. I have said I am dull and stupid, and that is the fact, but often the gods go out of way to take care of such. To recompense, they shower on me sometimes amazing luck. Look out, I don't get shower at any moment. Patrick Tate was on his feet. My dear sir, he remarked irritably, I question your authority to interrogate any of us. We are no longer in Honolulu. Pardon interruption, but what you say is true, Charlie put in. Legal side of matter is no doubt such as to give eminent lawyer bad attack of choleric. I judge from records of case, same has happened before. Can only say, captain of ship stands behind me firm as Gibraltar rock. We proceed on assumption every one of you is shocked and grieved by attack on Duff, and eager to see the attacker captured. If this is wrong, if there is a man among you has something to hide, just a minute. Tate cried. I won't let you maneuver me into that position. I've nothing to hide. I only wanted to remind you that there is such a thing as legal procedure. Which is usually the criminal's best friend, nodded Chan blandly. You and I, we know. Do we not, Mr. Tate? The lawyer sank back into his chair. But we are some miles off the point, continued Charlie. You are all friends of justice, I feel certain. You have no interest in that poor relation of same legal procedure. Let us go forward on such basis. Dr. Lofton, since you are conductor of party, I begin with you. How did you spend two hours mentioned by me? From eight to about nine-thirty, said Lofton sourly. I was at the Honolulu office at the Nomad Travel Company which manages my tours for me. I had a lot of accounts to go over and some typewriting to do. Ah, yes. Of course, others were with you at that office. Not a soul. The manager was due to attend a country club dance, and he left me there alone. Since the door had a spring lock, I had only to close it after me when I went out. 
I returned to the ship at about nine-thirty. Nomad Travel Company office is, I believe, on Fort Street, only a few steps from Mouth of Alley, wandering along rear of police station. It's on Fort Street, yes. I don't know anything about your police station. Naturally you don't. Did you encounter any members of Travel Party in neighborhood of Alley? I have no idea what Alley you're talking about. I saw none of my people from the time I went to the office until I returned to the ship. I suggest you get on with this. Time is pressing. Whom is it pressing? asked Chan suavely. Speaking for myself, I have six days to squander. Mr. Tate, do you cling to legal rights? Or will you condescend to tell humble policemen how you spent last evening? Oh, I've no objection, returned Tate, amiable with an effort. Why should I have? Last night about eight o'clock, we started a contract bridge game in the lounge. Aside from myself, Mrs. Spicer, Mr. Vivian, and Mr. Kennaway took part in it. It's a foursome that has had many similar contests as we went round the world. Ah, yes. Travel is fine education, nodded Chan. You played until the boat sailed. We did not. We were having a splendid game when at about eight-thirty. Mr. Vivian raised the most unholy row. I beg your pardon, Vivian cut in. If I broke up the game, I had an excellent reason. You have heard me tell my partner a thousand times that if I make an original two-bid, I expect her to keep it open, even if— So, you told me that a thousand times, did you? flared Mrs. Spicer. A million would be more like it, and I've explained patiently to you that if I had a flat hand, I wouldn't bid— no, not even if Mr. Whitehead was sitting beside me with a gun. The trouble with you is, a little knowledge is a dangerous— Pardon me that I burst in, Charlie said. But the matter becomes too technical for my stupidity to cope with. Let us seize on fact that game broke up. Broke up in a row at eight-thirty, Tate continued. Mr. Kennaway and I went out onto the deck. It was raining hard. Mark said he thought he'd get his raincoat and take a stroll up to the town. I saw him leave about ten minutes later. I told him I preferred to stay aboard. And did you? Charlie asked. No, I didn't. After Mr. Kennaway had gone, I remembered that I'd seen a copy of the New York Sunday Times hanging outside a newsstand on King Street yesterday morning. I'd meant to go back and get it. I hadn't seen one for ages, and I was keen to have it. The rain seemed to be letting up a bit. So I got my coat, my hat, and stick. Your malacca stick? Yes, I believe I carried the malacca. At about ten minutes of nine, I walked uptown, bought the paper, and returned to the ship. I'm a slow walker, and I suppose it was about twenty minutes past the hour when I came aboard again. Chan took his watch from his left-hand vest pocket. What time have you now, Mr. Tate? he asked quickly. Tate's right hand went to his own waistcoat pocket. Then it dropped back to his lap, and he looked rather foolish. He extended the left wrist and examined the watch on it. I make it ten twenty-five, he announced. Correct, smiled Charlie. I make it the same, and I am always right. Tate's bushy eyebrows rose. Always, he repeated, with a touch of sarcasm. In such matters, yes nodded the Chinese. For a moment he and the lawyer stared at each other. Then Chan looked away. So many changes of time as you peruse way around world, he said softly. I merely wish to be certain your watch is up to date. Mr. Vivian, what was your course of action after bridge table eruption? I too went ashore, Vivian responded. I wanted to cool off. With hat, coat, and malacca stick, no doubt, suggested Charlie. We've all got malacca sticks, snapped the polo player. They're almost obligatory when you visit Singapore. I walked about the city and got back to the ship a few minutes before it sailed. Mrs. Spicer? Charlie's eyes turned in her direction. She looked weary and fed up. I went to bed when I left the bridge table, she told him. 
It had been a somewhat trying experience. Bridge is only fun when you happen to have a gentleman for a partner. Mr. Kenaway, your actions have already been detailed by Mr. Tate. Kenaway nodded. Yes, I took my little stick and went ashore. I didn't stay long, however. I thought Mr. Tate might want me to read to him, so I came back to the ship soon after nine. But Mr. Tate, to my surprise, wasn't aboard. He appeared about nine-twenty, as he told you, and he had the times under his arm. We went to our cabin, and I read to him from the paper until he fell asleep. Charlie looked around the circle. And this gentleman? Max Minchin, Chicago. And nothing to hide, get me? Charlie bowed. Then you will be glad to detail your actions. Yes, and it'll take just one minute, see? Mr. Minchin fondled an expensive, half-smoked cigar, from which he had failed to remove a shining gold band. Me and Sadie, that's the wife, was doing the town in the rain. Well, the evening wasn't so much on the up and up with me, so I dragged the Frau into a picture show. But we seen that fellum a year ago in Chi, and Sadie was itching to get back to the stores, so we made our getaway quick. After that, just buying right and left. We didn't have no truck with us, and when we couldn't handle no more, Sadie agreed to quit. We staggered back to the ship. I didn't have no gat on me, and I wasn't carrying no malacca stick. When I carry a cane, it'll mean my dogs ain't no good no more. I told Sadie that in Singapore. Charlie smiled. Mr. Benbow, he suggested. Same story as the Minchins, that gentleman replied. We did the stores, though they're not much after those oriental bazaars. Sat a while in the young lobby and watched it rain. I said I wished I was back in Akron, and Nettie practically agreed with me. First time we've been in accord on that point since the tour started. But we were on good old U.S. soil, even if it was pretty sloppy. And we came back to the ship walking high, wide, and handsome. I think we stepped aboard about 9.15. I was dead tired. I'd bought a motion picture projector in Honolulu, and the weight of one of those things is nobody's business. Miss Pamela, said Chan, I already know how your evening was spent. Leaving, I think, only two yet to be inquisitioned. This gentleman, Captain Keene, I believe. Keene leaned back, stifled a yawn, and clasped his hands behind his head. I watched the bridge for a while, he replied. Not as a kibbit, sir, you understand? He glanced at Vivian. I never interfere in affairs that don't concern me. Recalling the captain's record outside various doors, Charlie felt the remark was somewhat lacking in sincerity. And after the bridge, he prompted. When the battle broke, Keene went on, I took the open air, thought some of getting my own little malacca stick and going ashore, but the rain gave me pause. Never did care for rain, especially the tropical kind. So I went to my cabin, got a book, and returned here to the smoking room. Ah, remarked Chan, you now possess a book. What are you trying to do? Raz me? said the captain. I sat here reading for a while, and about the time the boat sailed I went to bed. Was anyone else in this room while you were? Nobody at all. Everybody ashore, including the stewards. Charlie turned to the man whom he had purposely saved until the last. Ross was sitting not far away, staring down at his injured foot. His stick, innocent of its rubber tip, lay beside him on the floor. Mr. Ross, I believe you will complete the roster, Chan remarked. You went ashore last evening, I have heard. Ross looked up in surprise. Why, no, Inspector, he replied, I didn't. Indeed, you were seen to come aboard ship at 9.15. Really? Ross lifted his eyebrows. On authority not to be impeached. But I am sorry to see, in this case quite mistaken. You are sure you did not leave the ship? Naturally, I'm sure. That's the sort of thing I ought to know about, you must admit. He remained entirely amiable. I dined aboard, and sat in the lounge for a while after dinner. 
I'd had a rather hard day, a lot of walking, and that tires me. My leg was aching, so I retired at eight o'clock. I was sound asleep when Mr. Vivian, who shares my cabin, came in. That was in the neighbourhood of ten, he told me this morning. He was careful not to wake me. He is always most considerate. Chan regarded him thoughtfully. Yet, at nine-fifteen, as I have said, Mr. Ross, two people of unreproachable honesty saw you come up the plank, and you passed them on deck. May I ask how they recognized me, Inspector? You carried stick, of course. A malacca stick, nodded Ross. You've seen what that amounts to. But more, Mr. Ross, you were walking with customary difficulty, owing to one happy accident which is so deeply deplored by all. For a moment, Ross regarded the detective. Inspector, he remarked at last, I've watched you here. You're a clever man. You exaggerate shamelessly, Charlie told him. No, I don't, smiled Ross. I say you're clever, and I believe that all I need do now is to tell you about a queer little incident that happened on the ship late yesterday afternoon. He picked up his stick. This was not bought in Singapore, but in Tacoma some months ago just after I had my accident. After I bought it, I looked around until I found a rubber tip, a shoe, I believe it is sometimes called, to fit over the end of it. This made walking easier for me, and it did not scratch hardwood floors. About five yesterday afternoon, I returned to the ship and took a brief nap in my cabin. When I rose and went down to dinner, I was conscious of something, something wrong. At first I didn't know just what, but presently I realized, as I walked, my stick was tapping on the deck. I looked down in amazement. The rubber tip was gone. Someone had taken it. He stopped. I remember Mr. Kennaway came along at that moment, and I told him what had happened. That's right, Kennaway agreed. We puzzled over the matter. I suggested somebody was playing a joke. It was no joke, remarked Ross gravely. Someone I now believe was planning to impersonate me for the evening. Someone who was clever enough to recall that my stick made no sound when it touched a hard surface. No one spoke. Mrs. Luce appeared in the distant doorway and came swiftly to Chan's side. The detective leapt to his feet. What's this I hear? she cried. Poor Inspector Duff. Not badly injured, Charlie assured her, recovering. Thank heaven, she replied. The aim is wavering. The arm is getting weak. Well, too much shooting is bad for anybody. I take it you were with us in Inspector Duff's place, Mr. Chan? You arrive at good moment, Charlie said. I will request your testimony, please. Last night, after I brought you to dock, you and Miss Pamela sat on deck near top of gangplank. You beheld several members of party return to ship, among them Mr. Ross here. The old lady stood for a moment, staring at Ross. Then she shook her head. I don't know, she answered. Chan was surprised. You don't know whether you saw Mr. Ross or not? No, I don't. But my dear, said Pamela Potter, surely you remember. We were sitting near the rail, and Mr. Ross came up the plank and passed us. Again Mrs. Luce shook her head. A man who walked with a stick and limped passed us, yes. I spoke to him, but he didn't answer. Mr. Ross is a polite man. Besides, yes, Charlie said eagerly. Besides, Mr. Ross carries his stick in his left hand, whereas that man last night was carrying his in the right. I noticed it at the time. That's why I say I don't know whether it was Mr. Ross or not. My own feeling at the moment was that it was not. Silence followed. Finally, Ross looked up at Charlie. What did I tell you, Inspector? He remarked. I did not leave the ship last evening. I had rather a hunch the matter would be proved in time, though I didn't expect the proof so soon. Your right leg is injured one, Charlie said. Yes, and anyone who has never suffered such an injury might suppose that I would naturally carry my stick in the right hand. But as my doctor pointed out to me, 
the left is better. I am more securely balanced, and I can move much faster. That's okay, officer, put in Maxi Minchin. A few years back, an old pal of mine winged me in the left calf. I found out then that the dope was to carry the cane on the opposite side. It gives you better support, get me? Ross smiled. Thank you, Mr. Minchin, he said. He glanced at Chen. These clever lads always slip up somewhere, don't they? He added. Here is one who had brains enough to want my rubber shoe, so his stick couldn't be distinguished on that score, and then, in his haste, forgot to notice in which hand I carried mine. Well, all I can say is, I'm very glad he did. His eyes travelled questioningly about the little circle. Charlie stood up. Meeting now adjourns for time being, he announced. I am very grateful to you all for kind cooperating. They filed out, until Tate alone remained with the detective. He strolled over to Chan with a grim smile on his face. You didn't get much out of that session, he remarked. You believe not? Chan inquired. No, but you did your best, and on one point at least you showed unusual acumen. That about the watch, I mean. Ah, yes, the watch, Charlie nodded. A man who has been accustomed all his life to carrying a watch in his vest pocket and then switches to a wristwatch is inclined to put his hand to the old location when suddenly asked the time. So I noticed, the detective replied. I thought you did. What a pity you wasted that experiment on an innocent man. There will be more experiments, Chan assured him. I hope so. I may tell you that I purchased a wristwatch just before I came on this tour. Before you came on the tour. The first word was accented ever so slightly. Exactly. I can prove that by Mr. Kennaway. Any time at all. For the present, I accept your word, Charlie replied. Thank you. I trust I shall be present when you attempt those other experiments. Do not worry. You are plenty sure to be there. Good. I like to watch you work. And Tate strode debonairly from the room, while Chan stood looking after him. The investigation was young yet, Charlie thought, as he walked toward his cabin to prepare for lunch. No great progress this morning, but a good beginning. At least he had now a pretty shrewd idea as to the character and capabilities of the people with whom he had to deal. Know them better tomorrow. No place like a ship for getting acquainted. A boy appeared with a radiogram. Chan opened it and read, Charlie, as a friend, I implore you to drop the whole matter. I am getting on beautifully and can take up the trail soon myself. Situation is far too dangerous for me to ask such a service of you. Believe me, I was quite delirious when I suggested you carry on. Duff. Charlie smiled to himself and sat down at a desk in the library. After due deliberation, he composed an answering message. You were not delirious last night, but I have deep pain to note you are in such state now. How else could you think I would not pursue to very frontier of my ability this interesting affair? Remain calm, get back health promptly, and meantime I am willing replacement. Hoping you soon regain reason, I remain your solid friend, C. Chan. After a time, Charlie rose and walked out onto the deck. He was standing in a dark corner by the rail when he heard a stealthy hiss out of the night. He had completely forgotten Kashimo. His slim little assistant came close. Even in the dark it was evident that he bubbled over with mystery and excitement. Search all over, he whispered breathlessly. What? breathed Charlie. I have discovered key, the Japanese replied. Chan's heart leapt at the words. Well be, he recalled, had also discovered the key. You are quick worker, Kashimo the Chinese said. Where is it? Follow me, directed Kashimo. He led the way into the corridor and to a deluxe cabin on the same deck. At the door he paused. Who occupies this room? Charlie asked anxiously. 
Mr. Tate and Mr. Kenaway, the Japanese told him, and pushing open the door, flooded the cabin with light. Remembering the bridge game with relief, Charlie followed, closing the door behind him. He noticed that the portholes, which opened on the promenade deck, were safely shuttered. Kashimo knelt and dragged from beneath one of the beds a battered old bag. It was plastered with the labels of foreign hotels. The Japanese made no effort to open it, but lovingly ran his fingers over a particularly gorgeous label, that of the great eastern hotel Calcutta. You do same, he suggested to Charlie. Charlie touched the label. Underneath, he felt the faint outline of a key, about the size of the one Duff had shown him. Good work, Kashimo, he murmured. In gold letters near the bag's lock, he saw the initials M. K. Chapter 18 Maxi Minchin's Party After a few whispered instructions to Kashimo, Charlie returned to the deck and stood by the rail, staring thoughtfully out at the silver path of the moon on the dark waters. His chief feeling at the moment was one of admiration for his assistant. An ingenious place to hide an object like a key. It had made but the slightest protuberance on the rough leather of the case. The eye would never have detected it, only the fingers. Yes, Kashimo was undoubtedly a blunderer, but in this matter of searching, of meddling with the property of others, the boy was touched with genius. Charlie put his hand to his head. Puzzles, puzzles. It couldn't have been Kenaway. The murderer's settled policy, evidently, was to implicate innocent men if he could. Witness the matter of the strap in London, the theft of the rubber tip from the stick belonging to Ross. Furthermore, he would hardly care to have this key discovered in his possession. What more natural than for him to attach it to the property of another man? Who would have had the best opportunity to put that key on Kenaway's bag? Chan's eyes, fixed unseeing on the glittering water, narrowed suddenly. Who but Tate? Tate, who had been so prompt that morning to proclaim himself an innocent man, who had asserted that his change to a wristwatch had been effected before the tour started. Tate, who had slept in the room next to that in which Drake died. Tate, who had fallen in a terrific heart attack when he discovered next morning that Honeywood, the man Everhard meant to kill, was still alive. Certainly Tate was old enough to have been Everhard in his day, to have acquired those little bags of pebbles, to have carried them for years, determined to return them when opportunity offered. What more likely than that Tate had made use of his companion's suitcase? Chan began a slow stroll about the deck. No, the key was never Kenaway's. Suddenly he stood still. If Welby had found it where it was now, and it did not belong to Kenaway, then the little detective from Scotland Yard had not discovered the murderer. Why then had he been killed on the Yokohama dock? Again Chan put his hand to his head. Hi, I wonder amid confusing fog, he murmured. Much better I go to my pillow, seeking to gain clarity for the morrow. He took his own advice at once and the second night aboard the President Arthur passed without incident. In the morning, Charlie cultivated the society of Mark Kenaway. It meant considerable moving about, for the young man seemed restless and distraught. He roamed the ship, and Charlie roamed with him. You are youthful person, the Chinese remarked. You should study calm. I should say to look at you, you have few more than twenty years. Twenty-five, Kenaway informed him, but I seem to have added about ten by this tour. It has been difficult time, inquired Chen sympathetically. Ever been a nursemaid? asked the young man. Lord, if I'd known what I was letting myself in for. I've read aloud at night until my eyes ached and my throat felt like the desert's dusty face. Then there's the constant anxiety about poor Mr. Tate's condition. There have been other attacks since the one in Broom's Hotel, Charlie suggested. Kenaway nodded. Yes, several, 
one on the boat in the Red Sea, and a quite terrible one at Calcutta. I've cabled his son to meet us at San Francisco, and believe me, I'll be glad to see that golden gate. If I can get him ashore there, still alive, I'll consider that I'm a fool for luck. I'll heave a sigh of relief that will be reported in all the eastern papers as another California earthquake. Ah, yes, agreed Chen. You must have been under much strain. Oh, I had it coming to me, Kenaway returned gloomily. I should have started to practice law and let the map of the world alone. None of my people in Boston were in favor of this trip. They warned me, but I knew it all. Pamela Potter came up to them. Good morning, Mr. Chan. Hello, Mark. How about some deck tennis? I think I can trim you this morning. You always do, Kenaway said. The east is so effete, she smiled, and led the captive Kenaway off. Chan made a hasty tour of the deck. He found Captain Ronald Keene seated alone near the bow of the boat, and dropped into a chair beside him. Ah, Captain, he said, a somewhat gorgeous morning. I guess it is, Keene replied. Hadn't noticed, really. You have other matters that require pondering? Charlie suggested. Not a thing in the world, yawned Keene. But I never pay any attention to the weather. People who do are nothing but human vegetables. The chief engineer came strolling along the deck. He paused at Charlie's chair. About time for our tour of the engine room, Mr. Chan, he remarked. Ah, yes, returned the Chinese. You were kind enough to promise me that pleasure when we talked together last night. Captain Keen, I am sure, would enjoy to come along. He looked inquiringly at Keen. The captain stared back, amazed. Me? Oh, no, thanks. I've no interest in engines. Wouldn't know a gadget from a gasket. And care less. Charlie glanced up at the engineer. Thank you so much, he said. If you do not object, I will postpone my own tour. I desire short talk with Captain Keen. All right, nodded the engineer and moved away. Chan was regarding Keen grimly. You know nothing about engines? he suggested. Certainly not. What are you getting at, anyhow? Some months ago, in parlor of Broom's Hotel London, you informed Inspector Duff you were one time engineer. Keen stared at him. Say, you're quite a lad, aren't you? he remarked. Did I tell Duff that? I'd forgot all about it. It was not the truth? No, of course not. I just said the first thing that came into my head. A habit of yours, it seems. What do you mean by that? I have been reading about you, Captain Keene. In Inspector Duff's notebook, investigation of murder is serious business, and you will pardon me if I get plenty crude in my remarks. You are self-confessed liar, seemingly with no regrets. All through tour you have behaved strangely, listening outside doors. Not very lovable activity. No, I fancy it isn't, Keen snapped. You must have found that out in your own work. I am not sneaky kind of detective, replied Chan with dignity. Is that so? replied Keen. Then you can't be much good. I've been in the business six years, and I'm not proud of what I've done. Charlie sat up. You are detective? he asked. Keen nodded. Yes, keep it on your hat. I represent a private agency in San Francisco. Ah, private detective, nodded Chan, relieved. Yes, and don't be nasty. We're just as good as you are. I'm telling you this because I don't want you to waste your time on me. Mrs. Spicer has a husband, and he's eager to get rid of her. Wants to marry a movie actress or something like that. So he sent me on this trip to see what I could see. Chan studied Keene's mean face carefully. Was this the truth? The man certainly looked well-suited to the role of private detective, so he didn't want Chan to waste any time on him. Unexpected consideration, that was. You have had no success? the Chinese remarked. No, the thing was a flop from the first. I believe Vivian suspected me the moment he saw me. I dread meeting Spicer when we land at San Francisco. All this has cost him a pretty penny. 
But it wasn't my fault if love's young dream blew up right in my face. If they only hadn't been partners at bridge, that finished it. They're not even speaking now, and Vivian has threatened to break my neck if I come near him again. I'm fond of my neck. So I'm at a loose end from here on home. By the way, all this is on the quiet. Charlie nodded. Your secret is safe with me. I was wondering, continued Keen, couldn't I help you out on this murder thing? Is there any reward or anything like that? The reward of work well done, Charlie replied. Tripe! You don't mean to say that you've come into this without having an understanding with the Potter girl? Say, you need a manager. I'll go and have a talk with her. The family's got wads of money, and they naturally want to find out who killed the old man. We'll go fifty-fifty. Stop, cried Chen. You have already said too much. Kindly remember that I am not private detective. You have no authority from me for your low plan. Wait a minute. Let's argue this out. No. The ignorant are never defeated in argument. What is more, there is nothing to debate. You will kindly keep out of this affair, which does not concern you in the least. I am bidding you good day. You're a hell of a businessman, growled Keen. Charlie walked rapidly down the deck, his accustomed calm rudely disturbed. What a worm this fellow Keen was. All that about being a private detective, was it true? Possibly. On the other hand, it might be merely a blind, a tall story designed to put Charlie off his guard. Charlie sighed. Mustn't forget Keen. Mustn't forget any of them. The creaking ship ploughed on its way, making good time over the glassy sea. Kashimo reported the key still on Kenaway's bag. Long leisurely talks with one member of the party after another yielded no result. The second day passed, and the third night. Not until the fourth night did Charlie begin to take hope again. It was on that evening that Maxie Minchin entertained a grand party to celebrate the approaching end of the tour. Maxie had passed about with his invitations and had been, much to his own surprise, cordially received. Familiarity had bred charity where he was concerned. The long weeks together had led the party to overlook his crudities. As Mrs. Luce put it, we mustn't forget there's someone in this crowd who's even worse than Mr. Minchin. Everyone accepted, and Maxie was delighted. When he brought the news to his wife, she reminded him that, with Lofton, there would be thirteen at table. Don't let's take any chances, Maxie, she said. You've been getting all the breaks so far. Don't trifle with your luck. You gotta find a fourteenth. Mr. Minchin found the fourteenth in Charlie. I ain't got none against the dicks, he explained to the Chinese. I give a party once in Chicago for a table full of them. One of the nicest feeds ever pulled off. You, come along. Informal. I'm leaving my tux in the trunk. Thank you so much, Charlie answered. And may I hope that you will not be offended if at this dinner I make bold to refer to the subject of murder? I don't get you, said Maxie, startled. I mean, I have unlimited yearning to mention there the unfortunate fate of Hugh Morris Drake in Broome's Hotel. It would make me happy to hear conversation regarding this affair from one and all. Maxie frowned. Well, I don't know about that. I was hoping we wasn't gonna talk business. Just a good time for all and no questions asked, get me? Some guy in this gang got a lot on his mind, and I wouldn't like him to have any anxious minutes while he's my guest. After that, you can put the cuffs on him any minute, see what I mean? He ain't no pal of mine, but for the one evening... I will be discreet, Chen promised. No questions, of course. Maxie waved his hand. Well, have it your own way. Start the murder thing if you want to. There's no tags to my bid. It's Liberty Hall when Maxie Minchin is paying the check. Liberty Hall turned out to be the Deck Café where fourteen people sat down that evening around a lavishly decorated table. Knowing full well his duties as a seagoing host, Mr. Minchin had provided a comic hat for everyone. 
He himself put on a Napoleonic tricorn with a scarlet cockade, and thus equipped, felt that the evening had begun auspiciously. Eat hearty, folks, he ordered, and drink the same. It's on the house. I told them to put out the best they got. After the coffee, Maxie rose. Well, here we are, he began, near the end of the big hop. We seen the world together, and we had good times, and some not so good. Take it and all, I'll say it's been a swell layout from the start. And if you're asking me, we had one dandy guide. Lift your glasses, people, to old Doc Lofton, the grandest guy afloat. There were cries for a speech, and Lofton arose, somewhat embarrassed. Thank you, friends, he said. I have been conducting parties like this for many years, and I want to say that this has been in many ways one of my more, uh, memorable experiences. You have given me very little trouble. This is, of course, most of you have. There have been differences, but they have been amicably settled. You have all been most reasonable, sometimes under great strain, and I am grateful. Of course, I would be foolish to overlook the fact that our tour began under very unusual and trying circumstances. If Miss Pamela will forgive me, I am referring to the unfortunate passing of, uh, her grandfather, that midnight at Broom's Hotel in London. That is to say, between midnight and morning, uh, an occurrence that I regret more deeply than any of you, with, of course, the exception of the young lady I have mentioned. But that is now long in the past, and it seems best to forget it. If it remains among the unsolved mysteries, we must accept that as the will of fate. I shall land you all in San Francisco very soon, and we shall part. His manner brightened noticeably. But I assure you that I shall always treasure memories of our companionship. Hear, hear, cried Mr. Minchin, as the doctor sat down amid polite applause. Well, folks, since the docks brought it up, I may say that we're all sorry about that kick-off at Brooms. And that brings me at this time to mention our special guest here tonight, the Chinese Dick from Hawaii. Believe me, people, I've seen all kinds, but this is a new one on me. Mr. Chan, spill a few words. He glanced calmly about the little room. The drum, which makes the most noise, is filled with wind, he said. I remember this in time, so I will not obtrude myself. But I welcome opportunity to bow to my gracious host and to his delightful lady, obscured with plenty jewels. Fate is capricious, stage manager. She has introduced you to policemen round the world, to my distinguished friend from Scotland Yard, to the officers of France and Italy. Now you get sample from Melting Pot of Hawaii. You let your gaze for fleeting moment rest on humble Chinese, who follows meager clues left behind by the few criminals who infest our paradise. I stand here before you in not entirely happy position. Wise man has said, do not follow on the heels of a sorrow, or it may turn back. Such would be my own advice to Miss Pamela. But while I remain thus in upright posture, old sorrow will not fade from your minds. Mr. Minchin's roving eye fell on Mr. Tate. That gentleman rose with the manner of the experienced speaker. I am, perhaps, happier than any of you to be here, he began. There have been times when it seemed I must leave you long before this, but the determination to live is strong, and I promise that I shall finish with you as I began. In many ways, I feel that I am lucky. I have much to be grateful for. For example, referring again to my friend Mr. Hugh Morris Drake, and the night of February 6th, the morning of the 7th, I might have been the occupant of the bed in room 28, the innocent victim of a murder that was purely— He stopped and looked helplessly about him. Pardon me, I am off on the wrong tack there. We are, I fear— making this a rather unhappy evening for the charming Miss Pamela. I only meant to say that I am happy to have survived thus far on our tour around the world, and that it has been a great pleasure to meet you all. Thank you very much. He sat down abruptly amid subdued applause. Mrs. Luce obliged with a travelogue, 
and Pamela Potter said a few graceful words. Captain Keene arose. Well, it's been a great trip, he said. However, I guess it's about over now, and those of us who have work to do can go and do it. We've had a lot of fun, and for my part I'd almost forgotten the incident at Broom's Hotel. That was a bit of a strain, and no mistake. Inspector Duff acted for a while as though he intended to spoil the tour, for some of us at least. His questions were pretty personal. I don't go in for murder myself, but I happened to be wandering about that night, as you may recall. I had my bad moments, and I guess some of the rest of us were on the anxious seat too. I guess Mr. Elmer Benbow was a little bit worried, eh, Mr. Benbow? I haven't said a word to anybody about this before, but now we're all back in God's country, and I guess we can take care of ourselves. I saw Mr. Benbow at three o'clock, the morning of the murder, just as he was slipping back into his room from the hall. I imagine you're glad you didn't have to explain that to Scotland Yard, eh, Benbow? Keane's air was one of light-hearted banter, but it deceived no one. Underneath was a cheap malice that was unpleasant to contemplate. Even Maxie Minchin, though he couldn't have defined the feeling, knew that here was an exhibition of bad taste that took the palm. The little gangster leapt to his feet. The way things is going, you don't need a toastmaster here, he announced. Mr. Benbow, you've been elected the next speaker. The man from Akron got slowly to his feet. I've been doing a lot of speaking the past few years, he began but I don't know that I ever had to make a speech like this before. It's quite true. I was out of my room that night at Broom's Hotel. After we got home and got to bed, I suddenly remembered that February 6th was my daughter's birthday. We'd been intending all day to send her a cable, but we'd been so busy we both forgot. Well, I was upset and no mistake. Then I remembered the change of time, that it was six hours earlier in Akron. It came to me that maybe I could still get my cable to her that day, late at night perhaps, but still on her birthday. I jumped out of bed, dressed and hustled out. There were some scrub women in the hotel lobby, but I didn't meet any of the other servants coming or going. Of course, I should have told the police about this, but I certainly didn't feel like getting mixed up in the affair. It was a foreign country, different, you know how it is. If I'd been at home, well, I'd have told the chief of police all about it. But. England, Scotland Yard. I got cold feet. I'm glad Captain Keene brought the matter up here tonight. I'm glad to explain the thing. And I hope you believe me. Now, er, I had a speech ready, but it's clean gone. Oh, yes. One thing I do remember. I've been taking pictures all the way around, as I guess you know. You're all in them. I bought a projector in Honolulu, and Friday night, our last night aboard, well, Mrs. Benbow and I are entertaining, then. We want you all to be our guests, and I'll run off the whole trip for you. That's, that's about all now. He sat down amid loud and friendly applause. Several rebuking looks were cast at Keene, who received them nonchalantly. Mr. Minchin rose again. I guess it's up to me to make the next selection, he remarked. Mr. Ross, we ain't heard from you yet. Ross stood up and leaned heavily on his stick. I have no belated accusations to offer, he remarked, and a little round of applause circled the table. All I can say is, this has been an interesting tour. I've been looking forward to it for many years. How many, I wouldn't like to tell you. It has been somewhat more exciting than I'd bargained for, but I have no regrets. I'm glad I came on this party with Dr. Lofton, and with all of you. I only wish I'd been as wise as Mr. Benbow and made a record of my experiences to solace the long hours when I get back to Tacoma. As for that unfortunate night in London, when poor Hugh Morris Drake lay dead in that stuffy room in Broom's Hotel with Dr. Lofton's luggage strap about his throat. Suddenly, from far down the table, Vivian spoke. Who says it was Dr. Lofton's luggage strap? he demanded brusquely. Ross hesitated. Why, why, I understood at the inquest, he replied, that it was taken from the doctor's closet. We're all telling our real names tonight, went on Vivian, in a clear, cool voice. That wasn't Lofton's luggage strap. In point of fact, 
It wasn't a luggage strap at all. It was a camera strap, the kind you use to carry a motion picture camera over your shoulder. And I happen to know that it was the property of Mr. Elmer Benbow. With one accord, they all turned and stared at Benbow, sitting with a stricken look on his face near the foot of the table. Chapter 19 The Fruitful Tree In the tense silence, Maxie Minchin got slowly to his feet. He removed the Napoleonic hat from his head, and with a gesture of abdication cast it aside. Well, you bimbos are certainly making some dinner out of this, he remarked. Sadie, I guess we never give one like it before, did we? Way I figure it, guys that put on the feed bag together ought to act nice and friendly at the table, even if they do pull a gat on the stairs going out. Still, I ain't one to tell my guests how to behave. Mr. Benbow, you spoke once, but it looks to me like you gotta speak again. Benbow leapt to his feet. The stricken look had faded, and he appeared grim and determined. Well, he said, I guess I made a mistake. When I was telling you about that cablegram to my daughter, it flashed through my mind I ought to say something about the strap. I suppose you sent her that as a birthday present, Keene sneered. Benbow turned on him. Captain Keene, I don't know what I have done to win this hostility from you. I've regarded you from the first as a cheap and contemptible lightweight, but I thought I had kept my opinion of you hidden. I did not send that strap to my girl as a birthday present. I wish I had. Then it would not have been put to the use it ultimately was. He took a sip of water and continued. I heard about Mr. Drake's murder early that next morning, and I went to his room to see if there was anything I could do. That's what I would have done in Akron. It seemed the neighborly, kindly thing. There was no one in the room at the moment but a hotel servant. The police hadn't come. I went over and looked at Drake. I saw the strap about his throat, and I thought it was almighty like my camera strap. It gave me a shock, I can tell you. I went to my room, hunted up my camera, and found that the strap was missing from the case. Well, we talked it over, Nettie and I. Our door was always unlocked. I didn't like to go out and leave it that way, but the maid had requested us to do it. The camera had been there all the previous afternoon, as well as in the evening, when we went to the theater. It had been easy enough for somebody to slip in and get that strap. My wife suggested that I go and talk things over with Dr. Lofton. He looked at the doctor. I'm going to tell the whole business, he added. Lofton nodded. By all means, he remarked. Well, the doctor pooh-poohed my fears at first, but when I told him I had been out the previous night to send that cablegram, he began to look serious. I asked him if he thought I'd better tell Scotland Yard it was my strap, and also that I had been away from my room between two and three o'clock on the morning of the murder. Men have been hung on less than that. And there I was, in a strange country, first time I'd ever been out of the good old United States, and, well, I was scared stiff. It looks like I leave your party here and now, I said to the doctor. He patted me on the shoulder. Say nothing, he told me. Leave everything to me. I'm sure you didn't kill Drake, and I'll do all I can to keep you out of the investigation. Believe me, it was a good offer. I took it. The next thing I heard about the strap, Dr. Lofton had claimed it as his own. That's all I've got to say. Oh, yes, Vivian asked me on the channel boat where my strap was. He asked in sort of a nasty way. When I bought another in Paris, he made some crack about it. I saw that he was onto the situation, but he didn't seem inclined to do anything about it. For the first time in many moments, Chan spoke. He turned to Vivian with interest. Is this true, sir? he inquired. Yes, it is, replied Vivian. I knew from the first it was Benbow's strap. But there we were, in a foreign country and I didn't really think Benbo was guilty. I didn't know what to do. So I consulted the one man in our party who ought to know about such things, a celebrated criminal lawyer. Mr. Tate, I mean. I outlined the matter to him, and he advised me to say nothing. And now you disregard his advice, Charlie said. 
Not precisely. He and I were speaking about it today, and he told me he thought it was about time to get to the bottom of the strap business. He suggested I tell you. He said he thought yours the best mind that had yet come into the case. Chen bowed. Mr. Tate does me too much honor, he protested. Well, there's nothing more I can say, Benbo went on, mopping his perspiring brow. Dr. Lofton claimed the strap, and that led me out, he sat down. They all looked at Lofton. His manner showed that he was decidedly annoyed. His eyes were flashing. Everything that Mr. Benbow has told you is true, he remarked. But consider my position, if you will. There I was, with a murder in my party, and up against the most celebrated man-hunting organization in the world. My only object was to cut off their investigation at the earliest possible moment and get out of England with my party intact. I felt that if Mr. Benbow admitted those two damaging facts, he would certainly be held in London. One of them alone might not have sufficed, but both together, well, that would have been too much. I saw myself losing at the very start of the tour a couple of my best clients, and I was morally certain Mr. Benbow was entirely innocent. When the matter of the strap was brought up by Inspector Duff, I saw my way out immediately. I had not left my room the night before, and no one could say I had. True, there had been a little matter of warm words between Mr. Drake and myself, but that meant nothing, as the inspector was quick to see. I was not connected with the crime in any way. The strap was not unlike one I had about an old bag, not quite so wide, but the same color, black. I told Duff I possessed a strap similar to the one he was showing me. I went to my room, removed it from my bag, and hid it beneath a wardrobe that reached nearly to the floor. If my plan failed, I could pretend to discover it there and simply tell Duff I had been mistaken. Then I went back to Drake's room and told the inspector that I believed the strap used to strangle the old gentleman was mine. It worked like a charm. From that point on, the matter of the strap was no further interest to Scotland Yard. Mr. Benbow was safe and— And so were you, suggested Captain Keene, blowing a ring of smoke toward the ceiling. I beg your pardon, sir, glowered Lofton. I say, Benbow was safe, and so were you, Keene went on calmly. If there had been any disposition on the part of Duff to suspect you of the crime, you rather took him aback by claiming that strap on the spot. He figured that if you'd been guilty, you'd hardly have committed the murder with your own strap, and then admitted the ownership immediately. Yes, my dear doctor, it worked like a charm. Lofton's face was scarlet. What the devil are you driving at? Oh, nothing, nothing. Don't get excited. But nobody's been paying much attention to you in this affair. There you were, broken-hearted because such a thing had happened on a tour of yours. But were you? Mightn't there have been something more important to you than your tour? Lofton tossed aside his chair and strode over to where Keene sat. Stand up, he cried. Stand up, you dirty cur. I'm an old man, but by heaven. Gentlemen, gentlemen, shouted Maxim Minchin. Remember these ladies present? Charlie inserted his great bulk between Dr. Lofton and the captain. Let the refreshing breeze of reason blow over this affair, he suggested gently. Dr. Lofton, you are a foolish man to listen to unresponsible talk of this plenty flippant person. He has no basis whatever for evil insinuations. He took the doctor by the arm and led him a few feet away. Well, folks, announced Maxie Minchin, I guess the dinner's over. I was going to suggest we all join hands and sing Old Lang Syne at the finish, but maybe we better chop that. Open the doors. And for the sake of my boy at school, I hope there won't be no rods drawn in the hallway. Chan quickly escorted Lofton outside. Behind him, as he left, he heard the scraping of chairs, the breaking up of Max's interesting dinner party. Hot words will cool here on windy deck, he suggested. Accepting my advice, you will abstain from presence of Keen until you feel less fiery. Yes, I fancy I'd better, the doctor admitted. 
I've hated that sneering whelp from the moment I saw him. But of course, I mustn't forget my position. He gave Charlie a searching look. I was happy to hear you say that he had no basis for his accusations. None whatever that I discover, answered Chen blandly. I don't know, now that I come to think of it. It was a rather silly move, my claiming that strap. I can't explain it except for the fact that after you've traveled with groups like this for a few years, you begin to look upon them as children, somewhat stupid children too, helpless and needing protection. My first instinct is always to furnish the protection. One of my people was in trouble, so, as had happened many times before, I simply shifted his burden to my own shoulders and carried on. Charlie nodded. I understand plenty well, he reassured the older man. Thank you, Mr. Chen, Lofton replied. You seem an understanding person. I'm inclined to think I underrated you when we met. Charlie smiled. That is customary. I do not let it distress me. My object is to arrange so people are not still underrating me when we part. I imagine your object is usually attained, the doctor bowed. I think I'll go to my cabin now. I have a lot of work to do. They parted, and Chan set out on a walk about the deck. His step was brisk, his manner serene and composed. Much had happened at Maxie Minchin's dinner. Charlie smiled to himself as he recalled how much had happened. Someone called him from a steamer chair. Ah, Mr. Tate, he remarked. I will sit down at your side if you have no inclination for objecting. I am delighted, replied Tate. Ah, yes, you were kind enough to speak to Mr. Vivian in flattering terms of my poor brain power. The lawyer nodded. You justify my belief in you. I hardly expected you would overlook my indiscretion. We are talking, no doubt, about same thing. Oh, no doubt at all. Will you tell me, then, of what we speak? Gladly. It was rather a slip for me to admit that any one of us might have been in Hugh Morris Drake's position that night in Broom's hotel. It was indeed. You knew, of course that Honeywood and Drake changed rooms that night. Inspector Duff told you same on train, between Nice and San Remo. Yes, that was where he told me about the change. You know Duff's notes pretty thoroughly, I perceive. I must. They are my only hope. I find no record that you ever read a letter written by late Mr. Honeywood to his wife. I didn't even know there was such a letter. Yes, you knew that Drake was killed by someone seeking to kill Honeywood. You understand that poor man's taking off was, as you started to say, purely accidental? That it might have happened to any man in the party? Yes, I'll have to admit that I knew that. I'm sorry I let it out, but it's too late now for regrets. How did you know it? Duff never told you? No, of course. Duff never told me. Then who did? Tate hesitated. I suppose I shall have to confess. I got the information from Mark Kennaway. Ah, yes. And Mr. Kennaway got it from? According to his story, he got it from Pamela Potter. A brief silence. Then Charlie stood up. Mr. Tate, I congratulate you. You are out of that in neat fashion. Seeking the dancers on the promenade deck, he noted Pamela Potter circling that restricted floor in Mark Kennaway's arms. He waited patiently until the music stopped, and then approached the couple. Pardon, he announced, but this lady has next fox trotting with me. Just as you say, smiled Kennaway. Gravely, Chan offered his arm and led the girl off. The music was beginning again. I spoke with metaphor, Charlie remarked. My avoir du poids and dancing do not make good mixture. Nonsense, she answered. I'll bet you never tried. The wise elephant does not seek to ape the butterfly, he told her, and escorted her to a shadowy corner by the rail. I have brought you here not only for the fragrance of your society, which is delectable, but also to ask a question. 
Oh, and I thought I'd made a conquest, she laughed. Surely same would be ancient story for you, he replied, and hardly worthy of recording. Tell me this, if you will be so kind. You have related to others the matter you read in Mr. Honeywood's letter to his wife? You have told fellow members of Tour that murder of grandfather was accident? Oh, dear, she murmured. Shouldn't I have done it? Chen shrugged. Old saying has it, two ears, one mouth. Hear twice as much as you tell. I'm properly rebuked, she said. Do not fret. No harm may have been done. I merely wish to know whom you told. Well, I told Mrs. Luce. That was natural. And how many more? Just one more. Mark, Mr. Kennaway. Ah, yes. You noted tonight, perhaps, that Mr. Kennaway has passed information along to Mr. Tate? He should never have told that to Mr. Tate, the girl said. I ought to call him down for it. But I don't think I will. The mood tonight is one of tenderness. Let it remain so, urged Chan. I like it better that way myself. Kennaway, he noted, showed no signs of annoyance when he saw the girl again, nor did Pamela Potter seem especially irritated. As Charlie turned away, the purser faced him. Come with me, Mr. Chan, Lynch said. He led the way to his office. In a chair drooped Cashimo, evidently much depressed. What has happened? Charlie inquired. Cashimo looked up. So sorry, he hissed, and Chan's heart sank. Your helpy here has got himself into trouble, the purser explained. How do I know she will come back? the Japanese said. You speak in riddles, Chan told him. Who came back? Mrs. Minchin, the purser put in, returned to her cabin a few moments ago and found this boy searching there. She's got a billion dollars worth of knickknacks in her luggage, and her screams could be heard as far away as the Astor House bar in Shanghai. I promised her I'd throw the lad overboard myself. We'll have to take him off those cabins and put him somewhere else. I'm afraid his usefulness to you is ended. So sorry, Kashimo repeated. One minute, Charlie said. You will have plenty time to be sorry later. Tell me first, did you find anything of interest in Maxie Minchin's cabin? Kashimo leapt to his feet. I think so, Charlie. I find. I search hard, and I am good searcher. You said so. Yes, yes. What did you find? I find nice collection of hotel labels not pasted onto anything. Pretty labels from all hotels visited by these travelers. Labels that say Grand Hotel, Splendid Hotel, Palace Hotel. And was there one from the Great Eastern Hotel Calcutta? Chan inquired. No, I looked twice. Label from that hotel is not among those present. Chan smiled and patted the little Japanese on the back. Do not belittle own attainments any longer, Kashimo, he advised. Stones are cast alone at fruitful trees, and one of these days you may find yourself in veritable shower of missiles. Chapter 20 Miss Pamela Makes a List Charlie turned to the purser, and within a few minutes the question of Kashimo's future status on the ship was settled. It was arranged that he was to be transferred to a series of cabins on a lower deck, and that he must keep out of the way of the loudly vocal Sadie Minchin as much as possible from that moment on to the end of the journey. The little Japanese, crestfallen, slipped away, and Chan returned to the deck. Standing once more by the rail, he considered this latest development. If there were loose hotel labels available aboard the President Arthur, then it became more unlikely than ever that the key had been attached to Kennaway's bag at Calcutta, and had consequently been in its present position when Welby located it in Yokohama. No, it had unquestionably been elsewhere, in the possession of its owner. That person, not wanting to throw it away, but somewhat shaken by the Welby episode, had evolved the happy idea of planting it on Kennaway's suitcase, under the label of a hotel long since visited and left behind. He had known where such a label could be had. He might even have owned such a label himself. He might have been Maxie Minchin. 
Chan smiled to himself, and after spending a few moments in the library, went to his cabin. His first act there was to take out Duff's notes and study them once again. What he read seemed to please him, and he went cheerfully to bed, where he enjoyed the most complete rest he had yet encountered aboard the boat. Early the next morning, Charlie met Maxie Minchin pacing the deck, grimly determined on exercise. He fell into step beside the gangster. Hello, officer, Maxie said. Swell morning after the storm. Storm? Chan inquired. I mean that snappy little party I give last night. Say, maybe them birds didn't mix it, eh? Hope you had a good time. An excellent one, smiled the Chinese. Well, I was a little anxious myself, Maxie returned. A guy that's host, he can't get much of a kick out of a rough house like that. I thought for a minute it was going to end in a pair of bracelets for some bimbo. But after all was said and done, I guess you were just as far from a pinch as ever. Chan sighed ponderously. I fear I was. It's sure some mystery, Maxie went on. Me? I can't figure why any guy'd want to rub out that nice old gentleman. Something Tate said made me think maybe it was all a mistake. Maybe Drake got took for a ride because they thought he was somebody else. Such things do happen. I remember once in Chicago. But why should I let a bull in on that? What I was going to say, we had a little excitement in our cabin last night. Yes? Of what nature? Charlie was mildly curious. Us rich millionaires, Maxie continued, we gotta keep our eyes peeled every minute. The word goes round we're rolling in Jack, and after that, good night. I don't know what the world's coming to. No respect for property rights no more. It's disgusting. Sadie went back to the cabin, and there was a biscuit boy going through things like a Kansas cyclone. What a pity, Jen answered. I trust nothing valuable was taken. That's the funny angle on it. There was all that jewelry Sadie's been copping onto, valuable stuff. I ought to know. I come across for it. And when Sadie went into the cabin, there was this chink. Ah! Uh, no matter, cried Chan, catching himself in time. There was this chink with a bunch of old hotel labels in his hand. You have collection of such labels? Charlie inquired. Yeah, I've been picking them up from each hotel we've been to. Gonna take them home to little Maxie, that's my son so he can paste them on his suitcase. He wanted to come along with us, but I tells him an education comes first. You stay here and learn to talk right, I says. Even a bootlegger's got to speak good language nowadays, associating with the best people the way he does. Not that I want Maxie in the racket. He'll have all he can do to manage the estate. I'll bring you the labels, I says to him. It'll be as good as taking the trip. And as I just been telling you, with all Sadie's valuables laying around... It was them labels that caught the chink's eye, but he only had time to pinch one of them. Ah, one is missing. Yeah, the wife noticed it right off the bat. The swellest one in the bunch. We both remembered speaking of it when we got it. How pleased little Maxie would be. A Calcutta hotel. But it was gone. We couldn't dig it up nowhere. Charlie turned and stared at the gangster. The simple innocence of that dark face amazed him. Nothing there, save the anxiety of an indulgent father. I tossed in a kick to the purser, Mr. Minchin went on. But he tells me he searched the chink and he was clean. I guess he'd made away with the label. In China in the old days, he'd have got a pineapple in his soup for this. But, ah oh well, let it ride. Little Maxie won't know what he missed, and that's something. I congratulate you, said Chen. Life has made you philosopher which means peaceful days ahead. That's the kind I got a yen for now, Minchin replied. They finished the walk in silence. The afternoon passed swiftly, while the ship sailed on across a calm and sunlit sea. Evening came, the last of his evenings but one, and Chan was as calm as the sea. He prepared for dinner and, stepping out onto the deck, saw Tate about to enter the smoking room. Won't you come join me, Mr. Chan? the lawyer invited. Charlie shook his head. I am seeking Mr. Kenaway, he replied. Still in the cabin when I left, Tate said. And the number is? the Chinese inquired. Tate gave him this quite unnecessary information, and Chan walked away. 
he found Mark Kennaway busy with a black tie. Oh, come in, Mr. Chen, the young man greeted him, just trying to beautify the old facade. Chen closed the door. I have called for a private talk with you, he announced. I must have your word of honor. You will keep what is said in dark. Naturally, Kennaway seemed surprised. Charlie dropped to his knees and dragged from beneath one of the beds the suitcase with the interesting label. He pointed to the latter. You will regard that, please? You mean the label from the Great Eastern Hotel in Calcutta? What about it? Do you recall? Was it there when you left Calcutta? Why, of course. I noticed it after I got on the boat at Diamond Harbor. It's so striking one could hardly overlook it. You are certain this is the label you saw on that occasion? Well, how could I be certain of that? I saw one just like it. Precisely, answered Chen. You saw one just like it, but you did not see this one. Kennaway came closer. What do you mean? he inquired. I mean that at some later date, second label was pasted neatly over the first, and between the two, will you kindly run fingers over surface? The young man did so. What's this? he frowned. Feels like a key. It is a key, Charlie nodded. Duplicate of the one found in hand of Hugh Morris Drake one February morning in Broom's Hotel. Kennaway whistled softly. Who put it on my bag? he asked. I wonder, said Chen slowly. The young man sat down on the edge of his bed, thinking deeply. His eyes strayed across the room to another bed, on which lay a pair of pajamas. I wonder too, he said. He and Charlie exchanged a long look. I will put suitcase back in place, remarked the detective with sudden briskness. He did so. You will say nothing of this to living soul. Keep eye on key. It will, I think, be removed before ship reaches port. Kindly inform me the moment it is gone. The door opened abruptly, and Tate came in. Ah, Mr. Chan, he said. Pardon me, is this a private conference? Not at all, Charlie assured him. I found I had no handkerchief, Tate explained. He opened a drawer and took one out. Won't you join me for an appetizer, both of you? So sorry not to do so, the Chinese answered. What I require mostly is non-appetizer. He went out, smiling and serene. After dinner, he found Mrs. Luce and Pamela Potter seated together in deck chairs. May I intrude my obnoxious presence? he inquired. Sit down, Mr. Chan, the old lady said. I'm not seeing much of you on this trip, but then I suppose you're a busy man. Not so much busy as I expected to be, he answered quietly. He glanced at a sheet of paper and pencil in Pamela's hand. Pardon me, I think I interrupt. You are writing letter? She shook her head. No, I, I, well, as a matter of fact, I was merely puzzling over our mystery. The time is getting rather short, you know. No one could know it better, he nodded gravely. And it doesn't seem to me that we're getting anywhere. Oh, I'm sorry, but you came into the case rather late. You really haven't had a chance. I was just making a list of the men in our party, and opposite the name of each, I've been putting down the things against him. So far as I can see, every single one of them except Mr. Minchin and Mark Kennaway has been under a cloud at one time or another. Your list is not correct. Those two also have no claim to clean record. She gasped. You mean every man in the party has been involved? Chan rose and gently removed the paper from her hand. He tore it into tiny fragments and, walking to the rail, tossed them overboard. Do not worry, pretty head, over matter, he advised, coming back. It is already settled. What do you mean? she cried. Of course. There remains stern quest for proofs acceptable to English courts, but these will yet be found. You mean you know who killed my grandfather? You yourself do not know? inquired Charlie. Of course I don't. How should I? Charlie smiled. You had same opportunities as I. But then 
your mind was filled with young man who irritates you. As for me, I labored under no such handicap. With a beautiful bow, which included both of them, he strolled casually off down the deck. Chapter 21 The Promenade des Anglais Her eyes wide with amazement, Pamela Potter looked at Mrs. Luce. What in the world, she cried, did Mr. Chen mean by that? Mrs. Luce smiled. He meant that he knows who killed your grandfather, my dear. I rather thought he'd find it out. But how did he find it out? He said I ought to know too, and I can't imagine. The older lady shrugged. Even for your generation, she said, you're a clever girl. I've noticed that. Bright as a dollar, as we used to say. But you're not so clever as Charlie Chen. Not many people are. I've noticed that, too. Meanwhile, Charlie, having gone to the library and selected a book, was sitting there reading with the air of a man who has joined a book club and hopes none of his friends will call him up for a year. He read until ten o'clock, and after a leisurely stroll around the deck, sought his cabin. Sleep came to him without delay, the dreamless sleep of one who hasn't a care in the world. At eight o'clock the next morning, he was abroad on the sunlit deck. The final twenty-four hours of a most momentous journey were impending. If the realization of this was hanging over him, it evidently left him calm and undisturbed. From his manner it was clear he was one of those who feel that what is to be will be. Later that morning he had a long radiogram from Duff. He retired with it to his cabin. There, with the sun streaming over his shoulder, he read, Splendid news! How can I ever thank you? Get the proofs, Charlie. But I know you will. Cable from Chief says investigation Clark Jewelry Shop Calcutta reveals him once IDB in South Africa, meaning illicit diamond buyer. Inquiries among diamond merchants Amsterdam brought out further fact another IDB around Kimberley some fifteen years back by name Jim Everhard. Maybe help. Remember bags of stones? Scotland Yard man Sergeant Wales, in New York, time my accident, now in San Francisco, by chief's orders. We'll meet you at dock, prepared to make a rest. With him, our friend Flannery, like old times. Sorry can't be there. Mending rapidly, be on coast soon. Wait there for my thanks. Cheerio. Best of luck. Duff. Chan read the message a second time and when he came to the mention of Captain Flannery, an amused smile spread over his broad face. Fate was a wonderful stage manager, he reflected. He would be happy to see Flannery again. He tore Duff's message to bits and tossed them through the porthole. The day wore on without incident. Benbow came to him late in the afternoon. I don't know whether or not you understand, Mr. Chen, he remarked, but you're invited to that party of ours tonight. I couldn't get along without you. Policemen round the world, you said it. Chan bowed. I accept with unbounded pleasure. You will show your films? Yes, I've arranged to have the sitting room of one of the empty deluxe suites. We'll meet there about 8.30. I'll put up a screen I've borrowed from the purser. I must say nobody seems to be much interested. I am deeply interested, Charlie assured him. Yes, but the rest of them. You'd think they'd be keen to see those pictures, their own trip. He sighed. But that's the way it goes. A man with a camera never gets any encouragement. I suppose I'll have to lock the doors when I try to show those films in Akron. At 8.30, then, in cabin A. You are so very kind, Chen returned. I am honored beyond words. By eight o'clock, the clear skies that had for so long looked down on the President Arthur were lost behind an impenetrable curtain. The ship moved cautiously along through a thick fog that recalled London on the morning Hugh Morris Drake lay dead in Broome's hotel. At intervals, the voice of the foghorn, deep and sonorous, claimed for a moment the sole attention of everyone aboard. When at eight-thirty Charlie pushed open the door of cabin A, 
All the members of the party appeared to be already gathered inside. They were moving about, chatting aimlessly, but Mrs. Benbow, an efficient woman, soon had them seated in a little semicircle facing a white screen. Before this, Benbow laboured, busy with the many details that oppress a man about to show his own motion pictures. All ready, folks, cried Mr. Benbow. Mr. Kennaway, will you snap off the lights? Thanks. The first pictures, as you can see, are the ones I took on the deck of the ship just as we were leaving New York Harbor. We didn't know one another very well then. I think I got the Statue of Liberty. Yes, here she is. Take off your hats, boys. Now we're coming to some I got on the way across the Atlantic. And not many of you people in these. I guess most of you had a date with the little old berth down below. Here's poor Mr. Drake. Lucky he didn't know what was coming. He continued his prattle as the film unwound. They saw London again and Broom's Hotel. They had a few moments with the Phoenix, whom Benbow had met on a street corner and insisted on recording for posterity. The little man from Pittsfield was obviously somewhat resentful of the honour being done him. Then came the pictures of Inspector Duff, driving away from the doorway of Broom's, and evidently as unwilling an actor as Fenwick. Dover and the Channel Boat, Paris, and after that, Nice. Mr. Benbow's audience sat in attitudes that betokened an increasing interest. As the pictures of Nice were unrolled, Charlie suddenly uncrossed his plump legs and leaned forward. He was recalled to his surroundings by the voice of Tate, who sat by his side. The lawyer spoke in a low voice. I'm leaving, Mr. Chan he said. I, I feel rather ill. Charlie saw, even in that dim light, that his face was like chalk. I'll not say anything to Kennaway. It's his last night, and I don't want to trouble him. I shall be all right when I've rested for a moment on my bed. He slipped out noiselessly. Benbow was starting on a new reel. His pictorial record seemed endless, but now his audience was with him. Egypt, India, Singapore, China. The man had really shown remarkable intelligence in the scenes he had selected. He came at last to the end, and after thanking him, the party drifted from the room, until only Chan and the Benbows were left. The detective was examining the little spools on which the film was wound. An interesting evening, he remarked. Thanks, Benbow replied. I believe they did enjoy it, don't you? I am certain they did, Charlie told him. Mrs. Benbow, it is not just that you should oppress frail self with that burden. Your husband and I will together transport this material to your cabin. He took up the many reels of film and moved toward the door. Benbow carrying the projector followed. They went below. Once inside the Benbow stateroom, Charlie laid the film on the bed and turned to the man from Akron. May I inquire who has cabins on either side of you? he said. Benbow seemed startled. Why, Mrs. Luce and Miss Pamela are on one side. The cabin forward is empty. One moment, Chan answered. He disappeared, but returned almost at once. At this instant, he announced, both cabins quite empty. Corridor also is entirely deserted by one and all. Benbow was fumbling nervously with the projector. He got it into its case and began to buckle up a long black strap. What, what's it all about, Mr. Chan? he stammered. That is very valuable film of yours, Charlie suggested blandly. I'll say it is. You have trunk with good strong lock? Why, yes. Benbow nodded toward a wardrobe trunk in the corner. Making humble suggestion? Would you be good enough to bestow all reels of film in that and fasten lock securely? Of course, but why? Surely nobody. Chan's little eyes narrowed. Person never knows, he remarked. It would grieve me greatly if you arrived in beloved hometown lacking important reel. The reel, for example, that includes pictures taken at Nice. What is all this, Mr. Chan? Benbow asked. You noticed nothing about those particular pictures? No, I can't say I did. Others were perhaps more observant? 
Please do not distress yourself. Merely lock pictures all away. They have told their story to me, and may never be required by Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard, cried Benbow. I'd like to see them try to. Pardon that I interrupt. I must ask just one question. Do you now recall exact date when the photographs of Street in Nice were taken? You mean of the promenade des Anglais? Removing a worn bit of paper from his pocket, Benbow studied it. That film was exposed on the morning of February 21st, he announced. An excellent system, Chan approved. I am grateful. Now you will stow away all reels, and I will assist. This is Snaplock, I perceive. There, it has nice, strong appearance. He turned to go. Mr. Benbow, I am much in your debt, first for taking so many pictures, second for showing them to me. Why, why, that's all right, returned the dazed Benbow. Chan departed. He went at once to the topmost deck and entered the radio room. For a moment, he thought deeply. Then he wrote a message. Sergeant Wales, care Captain Flannery, Hall of Justice, San Francisco. Without delay, request Scotland Yard authorities obtain from Jimmy Breen, English tailor, Promenade des Anglais, Nice, France, full description of man who had work performed on, or about February 21st, calling for same on morning of that date, also nature of work done. Expecting you without fail on dock tomorrow morning. Charlie Chan, Inspector. With light heart, Charlie descended to a lower deck and began a thoughtful turn about it. Damp, dripping, clammy fog surrounded the ship on all sides. In marked contrast to previous nights, he walked a deserted path. The passengers had, with one accord, sought the brightly lighted public rooms. Twice he made the circle well pleased with himself and the world. For the third time he was crossing the after-deck, which was shrouded in darkness. Suddenly, amid the shadows at his right, he saw a black figure moving, caught the faint glint of steel. It must be set down for ever to his credit that he was rushing in that direction when the shot was fired. Charlie dropped to the deck and lay there, motionless. There followed the stealthy sound of quickly retreating footsteps, then a moment of grim silence. It was broken by the voice of the purser, leaning over Chan. In heaven's name, Inspector, he cried, what has happened? Charlie sat up. For a moment, I found the recumbent position more comfortable, he remarked. I am, you will observe, conservative by nature. Somebody shot at you, the purser said. Briefly replied the Chinese, and missed by one inch. I say, we can't have this sort of thing here, the officer objected plaintively. Chan got slowly to his feet. Do not fret, he advised. The man who fired that shot will repose in arms of police tomorrow morning, moment ship docks. But tonight there is no occasion for alarm. Something tells me there was no real effort to hit target. Kindly note size of same, and that aim has never failed before. Just a warning, eh? remarked the purser, relieved. Something of that nature, Charlie returned, and strolled away. As he reached the door leading to the main companionway, Mark Kenaway ran up to him. The young man's face was pale, his hair sadly rumpled. Mr. Chan, he cried, you must come with me at once. Silently, Charlie followed. Kenaway led the way to the stateroom he shared with Tate and pushed open the door. Tate was lying, apparently lifeless, on his bed. Ah, the poor gentleman has had one of his attacks, Chan said. Evidently, Kenaway replied. I came in here a moment ago and found him like this. But see, what does this mean? I heard that somebody had taken a shot at you, and look. He pointed to the floor beside the bed. A pistol was lying there. It's still warm, the young man added hoarsely. I touched it, and it's still warm. Charlie stooped and carelessly picked up the weapon. Ah, yes, he remarked. It remains overheated. 
and for good reason. It was only a moment ago, discharged at my plentiful person. Kenaway sat on the edge of his own bed and put his face in his hands. Tate, he muttered. Good Lord, Tate. Yes, Charlie nodded. Mr. Tate's fingerprints will indubitably be found on bright surface of pistol. He stooped again and drew Kenaway's bag from beneath the bed. For a moment, he stared at that innocent-seeming Calcutta label. Then he felt it with his fingers. There was a slit, little more than the length of a key, just above the center, but the heavy paper was pasted back into place. One spot was still rather damp. Plenty neat job, the detective commented. It is just as I thought. The key is gone. Kenaway looked wildly about. Where is it? he asked. It is where I want it to be, Charlie answered. On the person of the man who fired this revolver a moment ago. The young man stared at the other bed. You mean he's got it? No, replied Charlie, shaking his head. It is not on Mr. Tate. It is on the person of a ruthless killer. A man who was not above putting to his own uses the misfortune of our poor friend there on the bed. A man who came here tonight for this key, found Mr. Tate unconscious, saw his chance. A man who rushed out, fired at me, then returned here and after pressing Tate's hand about revolver to attend to fingerprints, dropped weapons suggestively on floor. A clever criminal if ever I met one. I shall experience great joy in handing him over to my old friend Flannery in the morning. Chapter 22 Time to Fish Kenaway stood up, a look of immense relief on his face. Charlie was putting the revolver away in his pocket. Thank heaven, the young man said. That's a load off my shoulders. He glanced down at Tate, who was stirring slightly. I think he's coming out of it now, poor chap. All evening I've been wondering, asking myself, but I just couldn't believe it. He's a kind man, underneath his bluster. I couldn't believe him capable of all those terrible things. Chan was moving toward the door. Your lips, I trust, are sealed, he remarked. You will repeat no word of what I have told you, of course. We have yet to make our capture, but I am certain our quarry is unsuspecting. Should he feel that his little stratagem here has succeeded, I think maybe our future path becomes even smoother. I understand, Kenaway answered. You may rely on me. He put his hand over the lawyer's heart. It begins to look as though I'm going to get poor Mr. Tate safely home after all. And from then on... No more jobs like this for me, Charlie nodded. To supervise his own destiny is task enough for any man, he suggested. I'll say it is, Kenaway agreed warmly. Chan opened the door. Er, just a moment, Inspector. If you should happen to run across Miss Potter, will you kindly ask her to wait up for me? I may be here for a half hour or so, but as soon as Mr. Tate falls asleep... Ah, yes, smiled Chan. I shall be happy to take that message. Oh, please don't go out of your way to find her. I merely thought it's our last night, you know. I really ought to say goodbye to her. Goodbye? Charlie repeated. Yes, and nothing more. What was that you just told me? To supervise his own destiny is task enough. For the timid man, finished Chan quickly. Mind is so filled with other matters. Regret to say, I stupidly misquoted the passage when I spoke before. Oh, said Kenaway blankly. Chan stepped into the corridor and closed the door behind him. The ship's captain was waiting for him in the main companionway. I've just heard what has happened, he remarked. I have an extra berth in my cabin, and I want you to sleep there tonight. I am immensely honored, Charlie bowed. But there is no need for such sacrifice. What do you mean, sacrifice? I'm doing this for myself, not for you. I don't want any accidents on my ship. 
I'll be expecting you. Captain's orders. Which must, of course, be obeyed, Chan agreed. He found Pamela Potter reading in a corner of the lounge. She put down her book and looked at him with deep concern. What's all this about you being shot at? She wanted to know. Charlie shrugged. The matter is of no consequence, he assured her. I am recipient of slight attention from a shipmate. Do not give it thought. I arrive with message for you. Mr. Kenaway requests you loiter up for him. Well, that's an offer, the girl replied. Mr. Tate has suffered bad attack. Oh, I'm so sorry. He is improving. When chance offers, Mr. Kenaway will seek you out. The girl said nothing. He is plenty fine young man, Charlie added. He still irritates me, she replied firmly. Charlie smiled. I can understand feeling, but as favor to me, please wait up and let him irritate you for final time. I might, she answered, but only as a favor to you. When Chan had gone, she picked up her book again. Presently she laid it aside, put on a wrap, and stepped out onto the deck. Tonight the Pacific belied its name. It was dark, angry, and tempestuous. The girl went over to the rail and stared into the mist. The foghorn somewhere above her head spoke at frequent intervals in a voice that seemed hoarse with anxiety. Kenaway appeared suddenly at her side. Hello, he remarked. Mr. Chan gave you my message, I see. Oh, it didn't matter, she replied. I had no intention of going to my cabin. Never be able to sleep with that thing blowing. They waited until the end of a particularly insistent blast. Jolly old horn, isn't it? Kenaway went on. Once when I was a kid I got a horn for Christmas. It's a pretty good world. Why the sudden cheerfulness? asked the girl. Oh, lots of reasons. I've been worried about something all evening, and I've just found out there was nothing to worry about. Everything's fine. Going ashore in the morning, Mr. Tate's son will be waiting. After that, freedom for me. I tell you I— The horn broke in again. What were you saying? asked the girl when it stopped. What was I? Oh, yes. Only myself to take care of, beginning tomorrow. It will be a glorious feeling, won't it? I'll say it will. If I shouldn't see you in the morning. Oh, you'll see me. Just wanted to tell you that it's been fun knowing you. You're awfully nice, you know. Charming. Don't know what I'd have done without you on this tour. I'll think of you a lot. But no letters, remember? The horn shrieked above them. Kenaway continued to shout indistinguishable words. The girl was looking up at him. She seemed suddenly very lovely and appealing. He took her in his arms and kissed her. All right, she said, if you insist. All right what? he inquired. I'll marry you if you want me to. That's what you were saying, wasn't it? Not exactly. My mistake. I couldn't hear very well, but I did think I caught the word marry. I was saying I hoped you'd marry some nice boy and be very happy. Oh, excuse it, please. But look here. Do you mean you'd actually marry me? Why bring that up? You haven't asked me. But I will. I do. I am. The horn again. Kenaway wasted no time in words. He released her when the blast was over. You really do care for me after all? She asked. I'm crazy about you, but I was sure you'd turn me down. That's why I didn't like to ask you. You're not going to turn me down, I take it? What a ridiculous idea, she answered. Wonderful night, the young man said. And so it seemed to him. I know where there are a couple of chairs in a dark corner on the after deck. They've been there ever since Hong Kong, the girl replied. They went to find them. As they walked along through the dripping fog, the horn blared forth again. The lad who's working that, Kenaway remarked, is going to get a big surprise in the morning. I intend to tip him within an inch of his life. Meanwhile, 
Amid the unfamiliar surroundings of the captain's cabin, Charlie Chan lay wide awake. He wondered if all old sea dogs snored as loudly as this one. He was aroused next morning by a knock at the door, and leaping up, he discovered that his cabin mate was already about and dressed for the day. The captain took a radiogram from a rather flustered boy and handed it to Chan. From Captain Flannery of the San Francisco Police, Charlie announced when he had read it. He and Sergeant Wales of Scotland Yard will be aboard immigration launch. Good, said the other. The sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. I've been wondering, Inspector. Hadn't I better put our friend under restraint until they come? Chan shook his head. Not necessary, thank you. I prefer he remain unsuspecting to the end. Mr. Tate will no doubt spend morning in cabin, and I shall spread underground word among Lofton party. We have our man in him. Believe real quarry will assume extra carelessness when he hears that. Just as you say, the captain nodded. I'm not keen about taking action myself, as you know, though after what you told me last night, I'd gamble a year's pay that you're right. I will instruct the second officer not to lose sight of your man until he's in the hands of the police. People have been known to disappear from boats, you know. A wise suggestion, Charlie agreed. I am grateful for your help. He had been rapidly dressing while they talked, and now moved toward the door with his bag. I will continue toilet. In my own room, please. Many hearty thanks for lodging of the night. Not at all. By gad, Inspector, you've been on the job this time. Ought to get a lot of kudos for your work on this case. Chan shrugged. When the dinner is ended, who values the spoon? He replied, and went out onto the bridge. The fog was rapidly dispersing, and a hint of sun was in the eastern sky. Back in his own cabin, he went about his preparations for the day with characteristic deliberation. On his way to breakfast, he stopped at the stateroom occupied by Tate and Kenaway. Both were awake, and the lawyer looked to be much improved. Oh, I'm fine, he said, in answer to Chen's query. I promised you I'd make San Francisco, didn't I? And I'll make a lot of other towns, too, before I'm through. Mark thinks I'd better stay in bed until we're ready to land. It's all nonsense, but I've agreed to do it. A splendid idea, nodded Chen. Has Mr. Kenaway told you of last night's happenings? Tate frowned. He has. There is one criminal I wouldn't defend, not for a million dollars. Charlie outlined his plan for the morning, and the lawyer readily agreed. All right with me, he said. Anything to get him. But of course... You'll let the members of the party know the truth before we land. Naturally, Chan answered. Then go to it. You say you've got your man. I don't suppose. Later, please, smiled Charlie as he left. After breakfast, he met the purser on the deck. I've got a landing card for you, that gentleman said. But as for Kashimo, well, I don't know. He's never been over here before, and of course he has no record of his birth in the islands. He came as a stowaway. He's admitted as much to me, and he'd better go back at once. One of our boats will be at the same pier, due to sail at two o'clock today, and I'll simply turn him over to her purser with instructions to return him to Honolulu. Chen nodded. I approve of plan, and so no doubt will Kashimo. His work is done. It was good work, too, and already he shows signs of yearning for home. I know he will be glad to hurry back and face the plaudits of his chief. Kindly arrange, he goes as passenger. I will supply the money. The busy purser nodded and hurried away. Further down the deck, the detective came upon Stuart Vivian. The San Franciscan stood at the rail, a pair of glasses in his hand, the empty case from which they had been taken hanging from his shoulder. Good morning, he said. Just had a glimpse of Russian Hill. By heaven, I was never so glad to see it before. There is no vision so restful to weary eyes as that of home, Charlie remarked. You said it, and I've been fed up with this tour for weeks. I'd have dropped out long ago, but I was afraid you policemen might think. 
By the way, I hear a rumor that you've found out who the killer is? Charlie nodded. A very distressing affair. It is indeed. Ah, uh, er, I presume the man's name is a secret? Not at all. Mr. Tate has granted full permission to make the matter public. Tate? cried Vivian. He was silent for a moment. That's interesting, isn't it? He looked at his watch. We're having a farewell meeting in the library in ten minutes. Lofton's giving out the tickets to those who travel beyond San Francisco, and his final blessing, I suppose. What a riot this news will stir up. I think maybe it will, smiled Chan, and went on down the deck. Twenty minutes later, the ship's engines were stilled at last, and they waited on the grey rolling sea for the launch bearing the customs men and the immigration officials. When the small motorboat arrived, Charlie was at the top of the ladder. Presently the crimson face and broad shoulders of Flannery hove in sight. Hello there, the officer cried. It's my old pal, Sergeant Chan as I live. They shook hands. So happy to see you again, Charlie said. But since the day long time ago, when I stood by and noted your admirable work on Bruce Case, there have been changes. For one thing, I am now promoted to inspector. Is that so? Flannery answered. Well, you can't keep a squirrel on the ground. An old Chinese saying. Charlie laughed. I perceive you have not forgotten me. Behind Flannery stood a solid mountain of a man. This, I presume, is... Excuse me, said Flannery. Shake hands with Sergeant Wales of Scotland Yard. Highly honored, Chan remarked. What's your latest word from Duff? inquired the sergeant. Steady improvement has set in, Charlie told him. And speaking of Duff, you have come for his assailant, of course, the murderer of Hugh Morris Drake in your London hotel. I certainly have, Wales said. I am happy to hand him over to you, Chan replied. So that the matter may not encounter too much publicity, I fix up little plan. Will you come with me, please? He led them to a stateroom, on the door of which was the number 119. Escorting them inside, he indicated a couple of wicker chairs. There were two beds, one on either side of the cabin, and beside each was a pile of luggage. If you will wait here, your quarry will come to you, he announced. He turned to Wales. One thing I would inquire about. You had message from me last night? Yes, I did, the sergeant replied, and I got in touch with the yard at once. It was morning over there, you know, and within a few hours they had an answer. The news arrived in San Francisco just before we left Captain Flannery's office. It's great stuff. Jimmy Breen told our representative your man brought him a coat to be repaired on February 20th and called for it the next morning. It was the coat of a grey suit, and the right-hand pocket was torn. Ah, yes, nodded Charlie. Torn by hand of aged porter in hallway of Broom's Hotel on early morning of February 7th. Murderer should have discarded that coat, but it is not his nature to discard, and from the first he has felt himself so safe. I would wager he shipped it from London to Nice, addressed to himself, and then engaged the able Mr. Breen. It was excellent choice. I behold on many tailor's signs nowadays the words invisible repairing. Screen was too small for me to note them on Breen establishment, but they should have been there. Many times I have examined that coat, but Mr. Breen was evidently master of invisibility. He stepped to the door. However, talk will not cook rice. You will await guilty man here, he added and disappeared. He found the Lofton party, with the single exception of Tate, gathered in the library, and evidently in a state of great excitement. At the only door leading into the room, Charlie met the second officer. With him, the detective held a brief conversation. All right, people, shouted the officer. The baggage is examined on the ship here, you know. The customs men are now ready. Go to your rooms, please. Mark Kennaway and Pamela Potter were the first to emerge. They were both in high spirits. Just like Yale Tap Day, 
laughed the young man. Go to your room. We'll see you later, Mr. Chan. We've news for you. That has happy sound, Charlie replied, but his face was grave. Minchin and his wife came out. Should I fail to see you again, Charlie remarked, shaking hands. My kindest regards to little Maxie. Tell him to be good boy and study hard. An idle brain is the devil's workshop. I'll tell him, officer, the gangster said. You're one bull I've been glad to meet. So long. Mrs. Spicer passed, with a nod and a smile of farewell. Mrs. Luce followed. You let me know when you reach Southern California, she said. The greatest country on God's footstool. Hold back your judgment on that, Mr. Chan, broke in Benbow, coming up. Wait until we've shown you Akron. Then forget them both, and come and look at the Northwest, added Ross. You're all wrong, protested Vivian. You'll be in God's country in half an hour. Keen and Lofton were approaching, but Charlie did not wait. Leaving the second officer at the door, he hurried away. Meanwhile, in cabin 119, Captain Flannery and the man from Scotland Yard were growing a bit restless. The latter got up and moved anxiously about. I hope nothing goes wrong, he muttered. Don't you worry, said Flannery generously. Charlie Chan is the best detective west of the Golden Gate. The door opened suddenly, and Flannery leapt to his feet. Vivian was standing in the doorway. What's all this? he demanded. Come in, the policeman said. Shut that door, quick, and step inside. Who are you? My name is Vivian, and this is my cabin. Sit down there on the bed. What do you mean, giving me orders? I mean business. Sit down and keep still. Vivian reluctantly obeyed. Wales looked at Flannery. He would be the last, of course, the sergeant remarked. Listen, Flannery whispered. Outside on the hard surface of the alleyway, they heard the tap, tap, tap of a cane. The door opened, and Ross stepped inside. For a moment, he looked inquiringly about him. Then he glanced back at the door. Charlie Chan was standing there, and to say he filled the aperture is putting it mildly. Mr. Ross, said Charlie, you will shake hands with Captain Flannery? of San Francisco police. The captain seized Ross's unresisting hand. Stepping forward, Chan made a hasty search. I perceive, he added, that weapon supply, which you have replenished so many times along the way, is exhausted at last. What? What do you mean? Ross demanded. I am sorry to say, Captain Flannery has warrant for your arrest. Arrest? He has been asked by Scotland Yard to hold you for the murder of Hugh Morris Drake in Broome's Hotel London on the morning of February 7th, present year. Ross stared about him defiantly. There remain other matters, Chan continued, but you will never be called upon to answer for those. The murder of Honeywood in Nice, the murder of Sybil Conway in San Remo, the murder of Sergeant Welby in Yokohama the brutal attack on Inspector Duff in Honolulu. Murder round the world, Mr. Ross. That's not true, Ross said hoarsely. We will see. Kashimo, Charlie's voice rose. You may now emerge from your hiding place. A bedraggled little figure rolled swiftly from beneath one of the beds. The Japanese was covered with lint, stray threads and dust. Chan helped him to his feet. Ah, you are somewhat stiff, Kashimo, he remarked. I am sorry I could not dig you out sooner. Captain Flannery, the Oriental invasion becomes serious. Meet Officer Kashimo of the Honolulu Force. He turned to the boy. Is it too much to hope you know present whereabouts of precious key? I know, the Japanese answered proudly. He dropped to his knees and from the cuff of Ross's right trouser leg extracted the key, which he held aloft in triumph. Charlie took it. What is this? Looks like plenty good evidence to me, Sergeant Wales. Key to safety deposit box in some bank with number 3260. 
Ah, Mr. Ross, you should have thrown it away. But I understand. You feared that without it, you would not dare approach valuables again. He handed the key to Wales. That's the stuff to give a jury, remarked the Britisher with satisfaction. The key was planted there, cried Ross. I deny everything. Everything? Charlie's eyes narrowed. Last night, we sat together, watching Mr. Benbow's pictures. Flickering film revealed you emerging from doorway of a shop in Nice. Did you think that I failed to notice? I might have, but for days I have known you guilty. What? Ross was unable to conceal his surprise. I will explain in moment. Just now I speak of Nice. Jimmy Breen, the tailor, remembers. He recalls grey coat with torn right pocket. Ross started to speak, but the detective raised his hand. Cards lie against you, Charlie went on. You are clever man. You have high opinion of yourself, and it is difficult for you to believe that you have failed. Such, however, is the situation. Clever, ah, yes. Clever when you hid that key on Mr. Kennaway's bag, a bag that would naturally be thrust under bed and forgotten until hour of landing was imminent once more. Clever when you discarded rubber tip from stick, then carried same in wrong hand, hoping some keen eye would notice. So many were under suspicion, you thought to gain by being suspected too, and then extricating yourself in convincing manner, which I must admit you did. You were clever again last night, when you fired wild shot at me, and dropped smoking revolver beside poor Mr. Tate. It was cruel act, but you are cruel man. And what a useless gesture, for, as I remarked before, I have known for several days that you were guilty person. You don't tell me, Ross sneered. And how did you know it? I knew it because there was one moment where you were not quite so clever, Mr. Ross. That moment arrived at Mr. Minchin's dinner. You made a speech there. It was brief speech, but it contained one word, one careless little word. That word convicted you. Really, what word was that? Charlie took out a card and wrote something on it. He handed it to Ross. Keep same as souvenir, he suggested. The man glanced at it. His face was white, and suddenly very old. He tore the card into shreds and tossed them to the floor. Thanks, he said bitterly, but I'm not collecting souvenirs. Well, what happens next? Chapter 23 Time to Dry the Nets What happened next? was that a customs inspector knocked on the door, and in that strained atmosphere made his examination of the hand luggage belonging to both Vivian and Ross. He was followed by a steward, who carried the bags below. Vivian slipped out, and Cashimo, after a brief word with Charlie, also departed. Captain Flannery took out a handkerchief and mopped his brow. Getting pretty hot down here, he remarked to Wales. Let's take this bird up to the library and hear what he's got to say for himself. I have nothing to say, Ross put in grimly. Is that so? Well, I've seen men in your position change their minds. Flannery went first, then Ross, and Wales was close behind. Charlie brought up the rear. They passed Mark Kennaway on the stairs. Jen stopped for a word. We have our man, he announced. Ross, Kennaway cried. Good Lord! I suggest you pass among members of travel party, clearing name of poor Mr. Tate. Watch me, the young man replied. I'll beat the time of Paul Revere, and he had a horse. Coming out onto the open deck, Charlie realized for the first time that they were moving again. On the right were the low buildings of the Presidio, and up ahead the fortress of Alcatraz Island. All about him the ship's passengers were milling, in a last frenzy of farewell. Flannery and Wales were sitting with their quarry in the otherwise deserted library. Charlie closed the door behind him, and the racket outside subsided to a low murmur. 
As the Chinese went over to join the group, Ross gave him a look of bitter hatred. In the man's eyes, there was now a light that recalled to Chan's mind a luncheon over which he had sat with Duff a week ago. You seek evidently two men, he had said to the English detective on that occasion. This was no longer the gentle, mild-mannered Ross the travel party had known. It was the other man, hard, merciless, and cruel. You'd better come across, Flannery was saying. Ross's only reply was a glance of contempt. The captain is giving you good advice, remarked Wales pleasantly. His methods were more suave than those of Flannery. In all my professional career, I never encountered a case in which the evidence was quite as strong as it is here, thanks, of course, to Inspector Chen. It is my duty to warn you that anything you say may be used against you, but my suggestion would be that you plan to plead guilty. To something I didn't do, flared Ross. Oh, come, come. We have not only the key, but the information from the tailor who— Yes, and how about a motive? The voice of the accused man rose. I don't give a damn for all your keys and your coats. You can't prove any motive. That's important, and you know it. I never saw any of these people I'm supposed to have murdered before. I've lived on the west coast of the States for years. I— You had a very obvious motive, Mr. Ross, Wells answered politely. Or perhaps I should say, Mr. Everhard. Jim Everhard, I believe. The man's face turned a ghastly grey, and for a moment— he seemed about to collapse. He was fighting for the strength that had sustained him thus far, but he fought in vain. Ah, yes, Mr. Everhard, or Ross, if you prefer, Wales went on evenly. Judging by information that came into the yard only a few days ago, your motive is only too clear. We haven't worried recently about motive. We've worried only as to your identity. Inspector Chan has cleverly discovered that. When the jury asks for a motive, we have only to tell them of your days in South Africa, of how Honeywood stole your girl. And my diamonds, cried Ross, my diamonds and my girl, but she was as bad as he was. He had half risen from his chair. Now he fell back, suddenly silent. Wales glanced at Charlie. Their eyes met but they were careful to conceal the elation with which they heard those words from Ross. You went out to South Africa some fifteen years ago, I believe, the sergeant continued, as a violinist in a musical comedy company orchestra. Sybil Conway was leading woman in the troupe, and you fell in love with her. But she was ambitious. She wanted money, stardom, success. You came into a small inheritance, but it wasn't enough. It was enough, however, to launch you into a business, a shady business, the trade of the IDB, buying diamonds from natives, from thieves. Inside a year, you had two bags filled with these stolen stones. Sybil Conway promised to marry you. You went on one last tour to the vicinity of the diamond fields, leaving those two bags with your girl in Cape Town. And when you came back to her, I saw him, Ross finished. Ah, oh, what's the use? You're too much for me, you and this Chinese. I saw him the first night after I got back. Walter Honeywood Swan, that was his name. I was in the little parlour of the house where Sybil Conway was living. A younger son, Wales suggested, a ne'er-do-well at home, out there a member of the South African police. Yes, I knew he was with the police. After he'd gone, I asked Sybil what it meant. She said the fellow was suspicious, that he was after me, and that I'd better get away at once. She would follow when the show closed. There was a boat leaving at midnight, a boat for Australia. She hurried me aboard, in the dark of the deck just before I sailed. She slipped me the two little bags. I could feel the stones inside. I didn't dare look at them then. She kissed me goodbye, and we parted. When the boat was well out, I went to my cabin and examined the bags. The little bags of stones, that's what they were, wash leather bags, each filled with about a hundred pebbles of various sizes, had been done. She preferred that policeman to me, she'd sold me out. So you went to Australia, Wales gently urged him on. You heard there that Sybil Conway and Swan were married, 
and that he now called himself Walter Honeywood. You wrote, promising to kill them both, but you were broke. It wasn't so easy to reach them. The years went by. Eventually you drifted to the States. You prospered, became a respectable citizen. The old urge for revenge was gone. And then suddenly it returned. Ross looked up. His eyes were bloodshot. Yes, he said slowly. It returned. How was that? Wales continued. Did it happen after you hurt your foot? When you lay there, idle, alone, plenty of time to think? Yes, and something to think about, Ross cried. The whole affair came back to me as vividly as yesterday. What they'd done to me, do you wonder I thought? And I'd let them get away with it. He looked wildly about him. I tell you, if ever a man was justified. No, no, Wales protested. You should have forgotten the past. You'd be a happy man today if you had. Don't expect any mercy on that score. Were you justified in killing Drake? A mistake. I was sorry. It was dark in that room. And Sergeant Welby, as fine a chap as I ever knew. I had to do it. And your attempt to kill Duff? I didn't attempt to kill him. I'd have done it if I'd meant to. No, I only wanted to put him out for the moment. You have been ruthless and cruel, Ross, Wales said sternly, and you will have to pay for it. I expect to pay. How much better for you, Wales went on, if you had never attempted your belated vengeance. But you did attempt it. When your foot was better, I see you gathering up all your valuables, your savings, and leaving Tacoma forever. You put all your property in the safety deposit box of a bank in some strange town. Where? We shall know presently. You set out for New York to find the Honeywood pair. Walter Honeywood was about to make a tour around the world. You booked for the same party. In Broom's Hotel, you attempted your first murder. It was a ghastly mistake. But you hung on. You sent that coat to Nice where you had it repaired. You had lost part of your watch chain, one of the keys to your safety deposit box. You debated with yourself. Should you throw the duplicate key away? You knew Scotland Yard would make every effort to find the owner of a safety deposit box numbered 3260. Could you go into a bank where you were practically unknown and call undue attention to yourself by admitting you had lost both keys? No, your only hope of ever seeing your valuables again was to hang on to that other key. The party went on. Walter Honeywood knew you now but he was as eager to avoid publicity as you were. He warned you of a letter that would incriminate you if anything happened to him. You searched until you had it, and that same night in the hotel gardens at Nice, you got him. You heard that Sybil Conway was in the next town. You didn't dare leave the party. You went along, hoping for the best, and that lift that was made for your purpose. After that, it seemed smooth sailing. You began to think luck was with you. Duff was baffled and you knew it. You moved on in peace, until Yokohama. There you learned that Welby had discovered the duplicate key. By the way, where did you have it then? Ross made no reply. Some clever place, I'll wager, the Scotland Yard man continued. But it doesn't matter. You sensed somehow that Welby had gone ashore to cable. He'd sent the message before you could stop him, but on the chance that there was no mention of you in it, as indeed there wasn't, you shot him down on the dock when he returned. Again you began to feel safe. I don't know much about what has happened since Yokohama, but I judge that when you got to Honolulu and met Duff on the pier, you saw red again. Nearly at the end of your journey, only a few more miles, and all serene, safe but Duff. How much had he learned? Nothing, that was clear. How much would he learn on that final lap of the tour? Nothing again, if you could prevent it. You removed him from your trail. Wales glanced at Charlie Chan. Right there, Ross, the Englishman finished. I think you made the big mistake of your life. Ross stood up. The boat was now fast to the dock, and outside the window the passengers were gathered about the top of the plank. Well, what of it? Ross said. How about going ashore?
They waited a moment on the deck, until the crowd on the plank had diminished to a few late stragglers, then started down. A uniformed policeman appeared before Flannery. The car's ready, chief, he said. Charlie held out his hand to Sergeant Wales. Maybe we meet again, he said. I have in bag Inspector Duff's briefcase, my study of which is now completed. Wales shook hands warmly. Yes, you've passed your examination on that, oh fancy, he smiled. With honours, too. I'll be in San Francisco until Duff comes. I hope you'll be here when he arrives. He'll want to thank you in person, I know. I may be. Who can say? Charlie returned. Good. In the meantime, you must dine with me tonight. There are still some details I'm curious about. Ross's speech at the Minchin dinner, for example. Can you meet me at the steward at seven? Delighted, Charlie answered. I stop at same hotel myself. Wales walked away with Ross in the company of the uniformed policeman. The man whom Charlie had at last brought to justice was wrapped in sullen silence now. His eyes, in those final moments, had studiously avoided those of Chen. Be in San Francisco long, Charlie? asked Flannery, coming up. Hard to answer, Chen replied. I have daughter at college in South California, and I have unquenchable longing to visit her. That's the ticket. Flannery cried, relieved. You go down and give a helping hand to the Los Angeles police. They need it, if anybody ever did. Chan smiled gently to himself. You have here no little matter on which I might assist? Not a thing, Charlie. Everything's pretty well cleaned up around San Francisco. But then, we got a mighty able organization here. Chan nodded. Under a strong general, there are no weak soldiers. You said it. A lot of truth in some of those old wheezes of yours. Well, Charlie, drop in and see me before you go. I'll have to run along now. As Charlie walked over to get his bag, he met Cashimo and the purser. Taking this lad aboard the President Taft, the purser said. He'll be on his way back to Hawaii, too. Chan beamed upon his assistant. And he goes covered with glory, he remarked. Cashimo. You have suffused my heart with pride. Not only did you do notable searching on boat, but when you came aboard that night in Honolulu, your suspicious eye was already on the guilty man. He patted the Japanese on the shoulder. Even a peach grown in the shade will ripen in the end, he added. Hope Chief will not be angry that I ran away, Kashimo said. Chief will be at pier with loudly playing band. Charlie assured him. I do not appear to make you understand, Kashimo. You are a hero. You are, I repeat again, covered with glory. Do not continually seek to push it aside like blanket on hot night. Go aboard other ship now and wait for my return. I go to city to purchase fresh linen for you. I am inclined to think six days are plenty for that present outfit. He picked up his bag and walked a few steps with them toward the plank of the President Taft. For the present, I say goodbye, he announced. We'll see you again, maybe at one o'clock. You are going home, Kashimo, not only in the shining garments of success, but also in a more hygienic shirt. All right, said Kashimo meekly. As Charlie was leaving the pier shed, he encountered Mark Kenaway. Hello, the young man cried. Pamela and I have been waiting for you. I've engaged a car, and you're riding uptown with us. You are too kind, Charlie replied. Oh, our motives are not entirely unselfish. I'll tell you what I mean in a minute. They went to the curb, where Pamela Potter was seated in a large touring car. Jump in, Mr. Chan, the young man added. Chan did no jumping, but climbed aboard with his usual dignity. Kenaway followed, and the car started. Both are looking very happy, Charlie suggested. Then I suppose our news is superfluous, the young man said. As a matter of fact, we're engaged. Chan turned to the girl. Pardon my surprise. You accepted this irritating young man after all? I certainly did. About a minute before he proposed at that, I wasn't going to let all my hard work go for nothing. My warmest congratulations to you both. Chan bowed. Thanks, smiled the girl. 
Mark's all right, everything considered. He's promised to forget Boston and practice law in Detroit. Greater love hath no man than that, nodded Kennaway. So it's turned out to be a pretty good tour, after all, the girl continued, even if it did start so badly. Her smile faded. By the way, I can't wait another minute. I want to learn how you knew that Ross was guilty. You said that night on the deck that I ought to know, too, and I've racked my slight brain until I'm dizzy, but it's no use. I'm no detective, I guess. Vivian told us a few minutes ago, Kennaway added, that it was something Ross said at the Minchin dinner. We've been over that speech of Ross's a dozen times. There wasn't much to it, as I recall. He was interrupted before he'd fairly got started. But not before he had spoken. A most incriminating word, Chan put in. I will repeat for you the sentence in which it occurred. I have memorized it. Listen carefully. As for that unfortunate night in London, when poor Hugh Morris Drake lay dead in that stuffy room in Broom's Hotel. Stuffy, cried Pamela Potter. Stuffy, repeated Charlie. You are now bright girl, I thought you. Consider, was the room in which your honorable grandfather was discovered lifeless on bed a stuffy room? Remember testimony of Martin, the floor waiter, which you heard at inquest, and which I read in Inspector Duff's notes. I unlocked the door of the room and went in, Martin said. One window was closed, the curtain was down all the way. The other was open, and the curtain was up, too. The light entered from there. Adding word of my own, I would remark, so also did plenty good fresh air. Of course, cried the girl. I should have remembered. When I was in that room, talking with Mr. Duff, the window was still open, and a street orchestra was playing There's a Long, Long Trailer Winding Outside. The music came up to us quite loudly. Ah, yes, but it was not in same room that Grandfather was slain, Jan reminded her. It was in room next door, and when Ross mentioned matter at dinner, his memory played him sorry trick. His thoughts returned, not to room in which Grandfather was finally discovered, but to that other room in which he died. You read Walter Honeywood's letter to his wife? Yes, I did. Recall how he said to her, I entered and looked about me. Drake's clothes were on a chair, his earphone on a table. All the doors and windows were closed. You observe, Miss Pamela, that was the stuffy room, the room where your grandfather perished. Of course it was, the girl answered. Poor grandfather had asthma, and he thought the London night air was bad for it, so he refused to have any windows open where he slept. Oh, I have been stupid. You were otherwise engaged, smiled Charlie. I was not. Three men knew that Hugh Morris Drake slept that night in a stuffy room. One, Mr. Drake himself, and he was dead. Two, Mr. Honeywood, who went in and found the body, and he too was dead. Three, the man who stole in there in the night and strangled him. The murderer. In simpler words, Mr. Ross. Good work, cried Kennaway. But finish now, added Chan. The Emperor Shi Huang Ti, who built the Great Wall of China, once said, He who squanders today talking of yesterday's triumph will have nothing to boast of tomorrow. The car had drawn up before the door of a hotel in Union Square, and when the young people had alighted, Charlie followed. He took the girl's hand in his. I see plenty glad look in your eyes this morning, he said. May it remain. Is vigorous wish from me. Remember, fortune calls at the smiling gate. He shook hands with Kennaway, picked up his bag, and disappeared quickly around the corner. The End This has been a production of Harmonic Wave, transforming text into the audio realm. Our programs are produced entirely in the USA 
and read by professional narrators. The publisher makes regular contributions for the benefit of our narrators who are members of the SAG-AFTRA Actors Union. These contributions are used to fund health and retirement benefits for all actors who are members of the union. Thank you for your continued support. Production Manager, Jessica Escalona. Executive Producer, Paul Fowley. Production Copyright, Annunciation, LLC. All rights reserved.